Dõi chiều sáng dần mình, ô ô ô chi mình, ô ô ô chi mình, ô ô ô chi mình. Vượt trùng sông, người đi khắp phương trời, liền tôi ý chí lòng núi cấm hơn. Ô chi mình người đi khắp năm châu lòng tin mặt trời chân lý sáng soi. Dõi chiều sáng dần mình. Welcome everybody to a Monday night theory and politics stream with me and Carlos. Uh, we're happy to be here with you, hanging out. Hope everybody had a good holiday break um, and a Merry Christmas. I hope you all won or fought and won the war on Christmas um, that we know is raging around us every day. So uh, yeah, happy to be here. How's it going, Carlos? How was your break? Uh, it was good. I actually, it was your comment right now that made me realize it was Monday. It feels like a like a Sunday with like a surplus, like a surplus Sunday, an extra Sunday. Um, no, it was, it was really good. How about you? Yeah, it was great. I hadn't gotten a break in a long time. So like that feeling of getting my last final done um, mm -hmm. for, for first semester was like a huge weight off my shoulders. And I didn't get as much time to read and write as I wanted to over break, but it was good to just relax. And then I got to read the, the, Grundrisa all day today, pretty much, which um, is what I got for Christmas for my parents. So, <laughs> um, yeah. And um, uh, I mentioned that uh, it's really good that you're starting with uh, the forward for Martin Nikolaus. Um, I believe he translated the book too. What's What's weird is that, and I'm I'm sure you'll agree with this. The forward is really really good, but mm. then if you look up the guy. Um, he didn't like publish anything else. And then he just turned into like this self-help guru of sorts. Huh. I could have swore because I, I read the Grandries, but I had skipped the forward and then I came back like two years after and read the forward as I was preparing for this longer writing project. And I was like, this is really, really good. Uh, and I looked him up and all I can find on his website was like self-help books. I was like, what's, what's going on here? Um, it's a real shame because it would have been interesting to see him write more. Yeah, I mean, maybe he's doing self-help books from a Marxist perspective, but I'm surprised because, like, he had a pretty good grasp on all three volumes of Capital and the Grandrisa. Yeah. And, yeah, I looked him up to see what else he had written. Um, I was like, couldn't find anything. I didn't even end up doing the research to the point where that you did where I found what he's doing now. But, um, yeah, it's like – Usually the people who write those forwards or write those introductions are pretty renowned Marxists. Like uh, mm -hmm. when I read Capital Volume 1, I spent a lot of time looking at the work of Ernest Mandel um, after I read his intro because it's like, oh, or maybe that was Volume... No, I was Volume 2, sorry. I can't remember who wrote Volume 1 um, <clears throat> forward that in the book that I have. But the Ernest Mandel one's really good um, despite him being a Trotskyite and throwing shade at the democratic people's republics, um, in the, in the forward, which is really lame. Um, cause a lot of people buy that copy and it puts anti-communist ideas in their head, but I don't know. He's a smart guy. He wrote a whole bunch of stuff later. So, um, that's weird that Nikolaus never, never did anything else in that. Right. Day. Cause I, there was, um, so when I, when I had started research, my, my main focus of research um, was 
in seeing what the secondary literature um, within Marxism, what, what, are, what were the different ways of thinking about how dialectics is picked up in Marx and Engels and then how it's developed in the 20th century? And the person who I came to like agree the most with that was in the West, and specifically, I think uh, Nikolaus is American, was him. And so, I mean, there's a, a few footnotes where he talks about the person who... So Marx had promised to do two or three sheets on dialectics where he would get the rational kernel that Hegel had developed and just lay it out there in two or three sheets. And he says that in a letters to Engels. And then in a letter to Dietzgen a few uh, years after, he says that he's going to write a pamphlet called Dialectics. But the point is that he wanted to sit down and write like what's important about dialectics, what Hegel got right, and what from that we should continue extending. Um, and he never was able to do it. But Lenin does have a, a small little piece called On Dialectics, um, which was published after his death. Uh, and it's contained within the 38th volume of the collected works. And Nikolaus says that like the, the best, uh, like the, the, the thing that plays the role that Marx's uh, short two or three sheets on dialectics would have played is that little uh, piece of writing from Lenin. And then he says that the only person who after that develops dialectics successfully and understands, you know, its, its essence as an outlook um, was Mao. So, I mean, this is, it's become somewhat normal, I guess, for our audience, because this is the way that we speak about dialectical materialism. But uh, for me, as someone who was engaging with a lot of Western Marxist things, seeing what here is of value, that was about the only one that I can find that was taking those positions. He even took up uh, Stalin's dialectical and historical materialism, which, of course, wow. is a, a chapter in the larger project on the history of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And he says it's like it's really good for like teaching people. It's got its flaws. It's simplified in various areas, but it's like really good for teaching. And I was, it's strange to see like such nuanced and, in my opinion, correct views come out of someone in the West that's writing a forward for, you know, what ends up becoming with the Penguin Publishing House or which collaborated with the New Left Review, what we now know as Verso. Um, as the book that you're supposed to cite from. Like when you cite from the Grand Ries or from Capital, you're supposed to cite from those Penguin uh, versions. Those are the ones that like journals expect you to cite from. And to have like such a good grasp of things within the West and writing within that context was surprising. Yeah, I was going to say, it's really interesting for like the Penguin uh, editions. That's what I have all mine in and pretty much every forward, like I was saying with Ernest Mandel has something like mocking the, you know, mm -hmm. the people's republics, they call it in quotations. Um, and basically spend the whole forward talking about how Marxism has failed. Um, not entirely. Ernest Mandel, you know, gives an honest attempt um, to, to look at the Soviet union um, basically criticizes them for not abolishing the commodity form. And says that's largely what led to the fall, but it's a good analysis of, what the Soviet Union was doing, how they were planning their economy, the reproduction schemas that they were coming up with. Um, so it's not like I totally hate the intro, but um, like I said, it's super harmful because um, most people in the West get their start into theory with those books. And, you know, reading the forewords is helpful, I would say, because it kind of maps out the book you're about to read. Right. Um, but they're getting that, like I said, anti-communist um, brainwashing. So, yeah, it's normal for us. Uh, to act, you know, praise Lenin and Mao as, you know, people who advanced Marxism and um, took Marxism and made it easier to understand for uneducated populations. Um, but it's not something you commonly hear in a publisher like Penguin. Um, so, yeah, that is yeah. cool. And I, I think the difficulty of that is that, like Mandel, what, what makes that downside worse i th i think it's the fact that in in the other side and just explaining the theory he's really good like he's a genuine really good marxist economist has a really good grasp of the three volumes of capital um and i mean some of the leading marxist economists today are infinitely grateful to mandel and his work 
And so that makes like the really bad views a little bit more unfortunate because mm -hmm. you get so much legitimacy through the right part. And a lot of the younger people that are just first engaging with this aren't able to parcel out like this is where he's really correct. And this is where I should have enough confidence to critique him. That's another thing that happens, I think, to young readers, which is that, you know, it takes a certain level of confidence to be able to get one of these people who are brilliant, who have studied their whole life and and to be like, yeah, this is right. But this other part, I think it's wrong for X, Y or Z. Yeah, that's kind of why I've gone away from recommending David Harvey's Reading Capital series. And I because personally, I myself, you know, just ended up throwing it to the side and just reading Capital for what it was. Because I felt like David Harvey, I would I would read the text and then I would read Harvey's interpretation. I'd be like, did I not understand the text at all or not at all? But mm -hmm. like he just had, you know, very different takeaways for me. And, you know, now probably takeaways that I would go back and criticize. But, you know, his reading of the book and was tainting um, the way that I was interpreting it and seeing it. And it, it just got much easier for me when I put it to the side. So. You know, it's difficult. And that's the, the main advice I give people when they go into those books is like, don't go into it like thinking or looking for anything or like, you know, thinking, OK, this is what David Harvey said. And just keeping that in the back of your mind the whole time. Just, you know, read it for what it is. Make your own thoughts about it and then listen to David Harvey. Then listen to all these other people um, and, you know, weigh your position versus theirs. Listen to what they say and, you know, um, make your analysis then but um yeah i don't know if you have anything else to say on that but i also wanted to um talk about this question because this is a I, common argument but i was just going to mention that david harvey um he's i think redoing his course on the grandrisa um i saw people's world uh, a friend of mine sent me a, an article from people's world that was promoting um harvey's new uh lecture class on the grandrisa and I think that it's available for people to like show up on Zoom. Um, I know he's he's done one before on the Grandrisa, so I wonder if it's going to be repeat like repeating uh, what what he did already, or if it's something new. But I mean, it's it's such a that that question is so difficult because I do want to hold on to the the spirit of like Lenin in 1920 speaking to the youth leagues, and he's like, you know, you have to take up if you really want to be a communist the wealth of knowledge that humanity has created which means you have to read a lot of stuff that you're going to disagree with in various areas. Um, and you should be able to parcel out the rational kernel from the mystical shell, right? Um, to keep with the language of how Marx described Hegel. Um, but it's it, it can also be very confusing for people that are just starting. And, uh, you know, what, what what ends up being the right course then? Is it like telling them, no, just focus on getting the... Marxist dialectical materialist outlook right and then read the other stuff or just have enough faith that even if they get their views it's kind of contaminated with eclecticism that eventually they'll stray down the correct path and I don't know if there's a correct answer um, for my personal experience was um, was of the first kind although there, there was moments where like eclecticism was trying to penetrate my thinking um eventually i over so it was a sort of mixture of both but it's that pedagogical task i i think it's uh it's something that in itself has to be investigated like what's the best way to teach people in the yeah. context of an outlook that's that's so often diluted uh through eclecticism but that you also want to like i want uh, we have our views about the Frankfurt School. We know like the political economy of knowledge that funded it, but I wouldn't tell people like to not read people from the Frankfurt School because I have read it and I can critique it in part because I've read it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would like to say the same thing with like Mendel and stuff, you know, some of these Trotskyite thinkers that there's stuff that's valuable in there and, and you should read it with a critical uh, lens. So I don't know. It's a, um, it's a question that I'm still interrogating myself. I mean, I think there's a lot to that. I mean, you have like, that's like what Lev Vygotsky basically dedicated his life to his pedagogy. I mean, obviously there's a bunch of people. There's the whole field of education. How do we teach this stuff? And, you know, specifically asking how do we teach Marxism or, or educate, 
you know, how do we best educate people about Marxism under capitalism so we can create a revolutionary situation? Um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely a question that needs to be investigated, but I think it's one that'll take a lot of research and, you know, we'll continue to learn about it as we go on. Uh, it's an interesting conversation, though. Um, I, I pulled up this comment um, from Ahmed. Uh, it says, if X person is neither a proletarian nor a bourgeois, doesn't this debunk Marx's theory of class struggle? Libs. Yeah, I've heard this. I've heard Libs say that, you know, because at certain points in history, different classes have teamed up with each other, um, that that means that, you know, history, you know, all hitherto existing societies, the history of class struggle, um, because that disproves Marx's theory, which is not true. Marx, you know, gives deep analyses of, you know, different classes teaming up and making alliances and, um, things like that. And he makes analyses of the different classes within capitalism. It's different. Um, it's different then than it is now, because like in the U S we have this giant service industry, um, that basically didn't exist under Marx. And a lot of our manufacturing and stuff has been outsourced to like the global South. Um, so you have the development of the imperialist world system that leads to a lot of that. Um, that obviously happens after Marx, but he still looks at, you know, the lumpen proletariat, um, the petty bourgeoisie. He recognizes there are other classes. Like if you look in CPUSA's manual from 1935, which I think is a really, really good text for um, American communists to read. That's when the CPUSA was really rocking. Um, I mean, they were just taking their cues from the USSR, but, but still, um, it's still a good book. They, they have a section, um, where it's just like, who can be the allies of the proletariat? And they just list certain classes, like the lumpen proletariat, the petty bourgeoisie, you know, so long as they do this and stand by these principles. It's an extremely practical manual. It's made to answer all the practical questions of organizing that you might have, um, that socialists might have. But um, yeah, there's definitely nothing in Marx that says there's only two classes in capitalism. There's some, the, the manifesto talks about the proletarianization and the cleavage into two great classes so people take that as you know mark saying there's going to be only two classes but um in his more complex writings he breaks that down right and just uh two years after writing the manifesto he would write the 18th premier and he's uh analyzing like seven different classes uh in france um and he's going in depth uh thinking about class itself as not just the, the relations that groups have to the relations of production, but he also introduces this very interesting passage where he says that class is also a way of distinguishing a group's culture from another um, and and the group's beliefs and ideas. And, um, you know, so it's, it's a lot more complex than the sort of spark note definition that is often taught in school makes you think i remember i had a sociology teacher in undergrad oh god this is one of those things where every time i think about it it makes me wish i could go back back in time and just shut her up because she she was like you know x or y thinker is better than marx because they see that there's these many classes whereas marx only saw these two and I was just getting started, so I couldn't, you know, I didn't have any other weapons to, to uh, counterattack. But it's so prevalent in academia, and it's it's so infuriating. But I would say that the the again a, a category developed by by Mao. Um, it was already in Lenin, but it was uh, concretized and made explicit by Mao as the category of antagonistic contradictions. Right, contradictions themselves are universal. They're never going away. They exist in, in nature and society and in thinking. Now, antagonistic contradictions are not necessarily universal. They they can arise. They can regular contradictions can turn antagonistic under different circumstances. And um, you know, even the the proletarian and the bourgeoisie in the beginning of the development of capitalism, they were not in an antagonistic contradiction to each other. Capitalism would have to, as a totality, develop. And that development would make explicit the antagonism that existed between the proletarian and, and the bourgeoisie. So what uh, 
you know, what determines the antagonistic character of a contradiction is not just directly the relationship of the two groups, the two classes to each other, but also the, the context in which that uh, relationship is examined. So um, in the US, uh, you know, it, I, I don't know if you can make an argument to the PMC being uh, antagonistic at, at the moment to the working class. I, had, I was actually in a conversation with the, um, one of our researchers and, and, and close friends I was in a conversation uh, with him about this a few days ago. Like to what extent, if we consider it to be true that the left is dominated primarily by a class position that's PMC and that uh, this class positions uh, develops a culture that comes from the iron triangle of academia, the media and NGOs, which is just basically anathema to working people. It makes working people go into these organizations and feel like they're in HR meetings. If that is the case, to what extent can we say that the PMC, because of the context, has developed into a, an antagonistic uh, position with regards to the working class? I don't think that's the case, but it's a good question to ask. And I think that um, with the idea in mind that antagonisms arise in certain contexts out of uh, contradictions, uh, it's a fruitful question to continue asking. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. The I wonder if you could even distinguish a little bit professionals from managers because like teachers, you know, are considered professionals and maybe they're not directly antagonistic to the working class. The, I mean, like when Act 10 was going down in Wisconsin, the teacher strikes and they're busting up the teachers unions. Um, the part that a lot of people miss is that 15 years earlier, they had busted up the private sector unions. Um, so then 15 years later, they came after the public sector unions and were able to turn the private sector workers against the teachers, the professionals, um, by saying, you know, they're the reason that your wages and benefits are down. It's because the teachers are, you know, you have to pay too much in taxes for these teachers. And then cut the teacher salary, busted their unions, and gave billions of dollars to this corporation, Foxconn. So, you know, <clears throat> there is that contradiction in that they're able to be turned against each other. But ultimately, their interests are similar. And maybe you could say the same thing about managers. But like managers are used as a tool. You know, they're used as a tool of control. My, my buddy would tell me when he worked at a clothing company, um, his manager would like keep track of what time he came in every day, how long he was going to lunch. You know, if he went to lunch for um, over an hour, he'd get in trouble and stuff. So they're used to extract as much labor out of the um out of the working class as they can and versus like an engineer i think engineers would probably be considered professionals they're non-unionized um during the john deere strikes there were a lot of engineers who were scabbing you know there were a lot of engineers who were helping with the manufacturing but there were a lot of engineers who refused um and didn't want to because they knew that if the workers wages went up and if the workers got better benefits that would lead to them getting better wages and benefits you know, and they would rise together. So I don't, it is a good question. I think it's pretty complicated. Um, there are antagonisms there, but, you know, they can also, the two classes definitely have similar interests most of the time. Right, right. Um, and, and that's the, that's a result of their sort of intermediary uh, character. They can go either way. Some can develop uh, bourgeois uh, consciousness and, uh, align themselves materially uh, with uh, interests that are counter to the working class and others um, can do the opposite, right? Um, so I, I, you know, I, I don't think that there's an antagonism at the moment uh, with these classes and, and the working class. Um, but it is, a, I think, a fruitful question to, to continue asking. Like they're not, it's not exploding into a very explicit fight between these classes in the way that the bourgeoisie and the uh, working class can uh, uh, produce that. So I, I wouldn't say there's an antagonism, but there is a, a tension and certain conflicts of culture and of emphasis that are there, even though there's a lot of overlap, even though both or each class uh, is at a disadvantage in the existing order, exploited, uh, some classes exploited in a form where more surplus value is extracted than in others. Um, others in non are perhaps in non-productive uh, industries, which again, it's not a normative term. It's just a, a technical term that, that Marx uses to describe a portion of the 
of the proletariat. Um, I just I I'm I'm in I'm in favor of having like a a coalition of 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 these classes that are at a disadvantage. Um, I, I don't want to say that like the PMC cannot be a part of socialist organizations. I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical when they become like the center of it, because I think the center should be the working class, and they can be involved. But Marx was he was very explicit about this. Like their the condition for their involvement should be that they leave behind all the petty bourgeois or professional uh, prejudices that naturally stem out of their class position, and that they adopt a proletarian outlook. So. It's not that they can't be involved, it's that the condition for their involvement is their adoption of a genuine working class outlook. And I don't know if that is what's happening. You know, what? how can you adapt a working class outlook when the majority of the people involved in the socialist movement are not necessarily from the working class? And I just, I just wanna make one quick point, which is that I, I think it's helpful to distinguish um, between classes and to be very precise about um, precise but yet dialectical realize that you know definitions pin stuff down and they in reality what they are is in movement um, but I think it's helpful to to consider like the differences that groups have to production and to what their wage comes from and to how much control they have over their work, all of those differences matter and should be accounted for. But yet there should also be some form of all-encompassing idea, which I think the what comes out of the the uh, the um, Occupy Wall Street movement, like the 99% idea, I think that could be something like that or the concept of the people in Spanish is at pueblo, where it includes like under one word, all the popular classes. Um, I don't know. I, I I don't know what route uh, might be the best. Perhaps they could both come in at different moments. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think you make some good points there. Like, I think for sure we can agree that the left is overly dominated by petty bourgeois ideology and professionals. Like, I remember a year or two ago, our buddy went to a DSA meeting and there were like health insurance executives there, and you know, like we said. Uh, there can be collaboration between professionals, um, but they weren't leaving their petty bourgeois ideology behind. They were arguing against Medicare for all in the meeting. They were saying, um, you know, can't, isn't there room for some private insurance? So it's like, you know, and that's where it becomes harder for a lot of people in these professional jobs. Like, say, if you work in the insurance industry um, to actually side with the proletarian side with socialism um, when you might be arguing for your own class position to be taken away because um, insurance shouldn't even exist. Um, and then, I mean, I think you, on the point about managers not being, or I mean the PMC not being um, an antagonistic contradiction, like they don't extract surplus value. You know, they're used as like a, a nightclub to beat the working class into submission, keep them in line and administrate, you know, um, and a lot of times because of that, that means working people direct their anger at their managers. You know, they don't like their managers um, because that's who they see every day. That's who's checking up on them uh, to make sure they're at work on time and not taking too long of a lunch break and um, doling out punishments um, when, you know, and, and that's fine if you can be angry at your managers and understand how that's exploitation and how that sucks. But like, you can't organize and attack your managers. You know, they're just doing their job. But it, you have to, you know, go to the top. You have to attack the capitalist who's using those managers. But a lot of people don't see that because, like I said, their main interaction at the workplace is the managerial staff. I remember that at the um, the nursing home I worked at, the managers didn't do anything. They would sit around and drink soda all day and scroll through Facebook um, and then make make the nurses and workers come in if it was like, you know, if, even if we had like 20 inches of snow the night before and they'd be like, well, you know, you should have come the night before and slept over here at the nursing home for free. You know, they wouldn't even pay the nurses to do that. They would just demand that they um, stay the night before if there was going to be bad weather. Um, so a lot of people hated the managers, but, and I guess that was a nonprofit, but you got to look at um, 
you know, the capitalist who's extracting surplus value, who's using that managerial staff to extract surplus value um, and then using that surplus value to pay for the managerial staff um, because it's worth it because they lead to the extraction of more labor. So, I mean, materially, it's not an it's not an antagonistic contradiction, in my opinion, because of that, because they're not actually extracting surplus value. There's nothing that's going to happen if you organize against your manager. You know, you and your you know, you should try and get your manager on your side and point him towards the boss. Right. And it wasn't always like this. I think it I might be wrong, but it might be with Taft Hartley where managers are prevented from unionizing with uh, workers, um, which effectively puts their interest uh, exponentially more with uh, the bosses. But they're called under the broad term of middle class for a reason um, because they have a bit of both. And in that limbo, they can potentially go either way. Um, But we had a a question here. Someone asked, let me see if I find it, what the PMC uh, was. And I wanted to, yeah. Who do you classify as PMC? It might be this one. Oh, I have um, a lot to say about that one. Can we touch I, on that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me uh, leave it up then. Um, I mean, yeah, do you have something to say? I, I pulled up a quote because the, the concept comes from these two people that are they're theorists from the New Left movement, um, but they're writing in, in 1978, Barbara and John Aaron reach. And uh, they're the ones that developed the concept of the professional managerial class. And they define it in the following manner. Uh, They say, uh, we define the professional managerial class as consisting of salaried mental workers who do not own the means of production and whose major function in the social division of labor may be described broadly as the reproduction of capitalist culture and capitalist class relations. And that's why I think that the, the concept of the Iron Triangle which has been developed by by this one uh, Marxist caucus within DSA called Class Unity. Um, we've been in touch with, and, and they're pretty awesome. The Iron Triangle refers to the three major institutions where the PMC is embedded in, um, which is the academy, uh, the media, and NGOs. And these institutions develop a certain culture and a certain outlook a certain way of proceeding, organizing, and uh, just very small things that are, you know, tied to the culture of the PMC, which um, isn't necessarily too comforting for a a big chunk of the working class. For parts of the working class that, like, went to college and experienced that atmosphere, it's it's fine for them. But um, I do think this is something that that we have to look at because never before has it been the case that a non-productive class has been the heart of a socialist movement. And that seems to have, that seems to be the case since, they're arguing since the late seventies has been the case that the PMC is the heart of, of what socialist organi- organizations uh, are. Um, in China and in Russia and in Cuba, where it wasn't necessarily the proletarian class at the forefront, where it was a peasantry that was also either at the forefront or extremely influential alongside the proletariat, you're still talking about a productive class, right? A class that's leading to the creation of, of surplus value in a different form than in commodity production, but that's still being exploited. Um, I don't know if that's the case with the PMC. It's a very unique position that we're in. Yeah, I'm glad I let you go first with that because I wanted to just respond to the specific. Uh, I want. I have something to say about nurses, uh, but that's that was a good explanation you gave of what the PMC class is in general and give, you know, giving a definition of it, which you don't get a lot, you know, tons of people talk about the PMC and we've probably been guilty of this too, um, without ever strictly defining what it is. Um, but in my studies of healthcare administration and, you know, I don't know, maybe you could, um, classify nurses as, as PMC, but from my understanding, nurses are, the most like within the structure of healthcare, they're the closest thing to a proletariat, like the most revolutionary class of workers in healthcare is the nurses. And it's not even close. The nurses are unionized. The nurses are fighting for Medicare for all. You know, the nurses are on the forefront of everything. 
Um, whereas physicians are more petty bourgeoisie. A lot of physicians own their own practices, you know, and um, a lot of them are doing this fee for service model where the more care they sell, the more they get paid. And, you know, they're in cahoots with the conglomerates, but the nurses are just exploited. Like I was telling earlier, the stories about the, the nurses at the nursing home. Um, they're by far the most exploited people in healthcare, um, which has led them to be the most radical um, and the most revolutionary class within healthcare. And, it, and not only, you know, demanding structural political change, but change within the healthcare system itself, you know, targeting their actual workplace um, in the actual system, which is, you know, great to see and what, what everybody should be trying to do. Um, so that's my opinion on nurses after looking at healthcare for the last year and a half, like organize the nurses. <laughs> it's worth it. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I don't want to say that, that realizing that whether a certain group is or is not working class shouldn't take away from their potential to be uh, organized it doesn't mean that they're not at a disadvantage in the existing order. Um, it doesn't mean that they're not exploited. Um, I, I think that with the case of nurses, the classification that I would give, um, and again, all of these things are fluid because in one moment they could do one thing. And then when they do another thing, suddenly the labor becomes, it, it goes from being unproductive to productive. Um, but I think that the in, in general, the category of unproductive proletarian, which again is not unproductive in the sense of they're just sitting around and doing nothing. Um, but in the sense that the, the, the stuff that they're engaging with is primarily put to service with their labor instead of uh, added a sur surplus. There's no surplus added. There's, there's service. And that service is fundamental in order for the surplus to be realized. And Marx considered that these unproductive uh, workers are being exploited. He does consider them to be proletarians. So they're part of the working class, but he considers them to be unproductive because they're not at the point of production where surplus value is ultimately created, but they still play a fundamental role for that surplus value to be realized in into profit. And so that's how I would classify them. And Marx noticed that as capitalism continues to develop, the bourgeoisie continues to need more and more chunks of the proletariat. Uh, it, it continues to need more unproductive proletarians. So it needs by necessity to expand like service work or, or work that's, he, he ends up using a lot of metaphors in the first volume of Capital. Uh, uh, metaphors and a lot of examples to like ancient Rome and, and, and previous uh, non-capitalist class societies where they required this class of laborers that was just there in order to help the ruling class realize their leisures and, and to realize their desires. So, yeah, I don't know. That's that's how I would classify them. Of course, they're organizable. Of course, they're working class. Um, but I would just say that in, in general, I think what comes to mind when I think of a nurse is service, and that would make it unproductive uh, proletarians. Yeah, and... I mean, with the nurse, it's a little different because, like you said, they're performing a service. But Marx also gets a little – like, he's n not super clear. I don't think he ever comes to a super definitive answer on what a productive labor is, especially when he's talking about the right. transport industry. It's almost like sometimes yeah. he'll contradict himself within the same sentence. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, like, we should organize truckers and, and you know, they're a very – they're vital to the, the sphere of circulation, which is necessary for um, – the, the circulation of capital overall. So it's like, you know, we should organize them for sure. Same with like service workers now too. Like, you know, there's so much, so many arguments about like baristas and Starbucks baristas and people poo pooing their organizing efforts. It's like, you know, they're, they're part of the circulation process in modern consumerist America. Like they're worth organizing. They are worth agents class, of circulation. So. That's right. Yeah. Agents of circulation, of circulation. is the word he uses. When he's yeah talking about transport workers and and the development of rail and how transport develops and circulation develops, which is a huge part of the development of capitalism as a system, is the development of trade and, and the means of trade. So it's worth organizing those workers for sure. I mean, we do like people also say who cares? It's unimportant who's a productive worker and who's not. Like 
it does matter, you know, we should, we, cause we should be looking to organize workers at the core of the economy. Um, the, the productive proletarians, um, who are producing the means of subsistence and having, uh, and creating surplus value for capitalists. Um, but you know, just cause we should target them and make sure we include them and understand that it's actually vital to have them as part of the movement. Uh, doesn't mean we shouldn't organize, you know, every, every working class person, regardless right, right, of right. The service industry or not. I think it's important just because it's a, it's a science. You're, you're trying to get it right. You're not just trying to go by um, what's normatively right. Like it's obviously normatively correct to include all of these sectors of society that are disadvantaged by capital and a struggle for a society that, like you said, with the nurses, like National Nurses United is one of the most radical uh, unions, I think, in the country. Um, it so it's, uh, and it's been that way for like a decade now, at least. So I, I, but I, I do think it's, a, it's important again, to draw those distinctions, but also to be able at the moment of like political activism or something to have a concept that you can refer more broadly to everyone involved in the struggle for, so like the popular classes or the people or something like that. Um, even like to, to take it real back and. And like we have the concept of democracy, it's composed of demos and kratos. Kratos is power. Demos, we just say people as if it's just people in general. Like if you can pick a uh, a, a a financier from Wall Street and just be like, oh, people. But that's not what demos meant in Greece. It meant common people, usually like the poor folk, the people who work. Um, so I, I do think that a general concept like that is necessary in Cuba. You use the concept of a pueblo and a pueblo refers to like six or seven classes. Um, but it's still important, I think, to to make those distinctions. And you're right that Marx is very ambiguous when it comes to doing that. And I think in part it's because of the fact that definitions are death in a certain way. Definitions are death because they... In order to define something, you have to just take it out of a context in which it is, in which it exists in motions and in interrelations in order to say, this is this. But the problem is that in reality, you know, if take service work, right, which would be considered unproductive. If you look at a person serving you as a subway, when they make, when they help you make the transaction, it's unproductive labor when they get all the different elements of a sandwich and they put it together, they have added value to all the different things that are there by making a sandwich. And right. so it's both productive and unproductive. A part of the work is productive. A part of it is unproductive. And so I think some of the contradictions that appear are a natural result of the heterogeneous character that most of the jobs we have in our country have where part of it are, is unproductive. Another part is, is productive. Yeah, I've made that argument because I've heard people say, you know, the, the baristas aren't productive at all. They're just selling people their coffee. And it's like, well, but they grind the coffee and put it in a cup. You know, it's like, so is that productive? Um, and that's why, you know, and that's why it gets so complicated when Marx is looking at this, you know, because he's asking himself the same questions like, OK, there's some people who are transporting the product. Um, but while they transport the product, they're also manipulating the product, you know, right. so that's a labor input. And, and then they're actually taking part in um you know, production of the means of subsistence. So, um, yeah, I do. I know we had we were we said we were going to talk about two theoretical topics and and one political topic. I don't know if we ever hammered down what those are going to be, but um, do you want me to ramble about the Grundrisse for a little bit? Um, uh, yeah, Jacob, sure. I sorry. thought it was I thought it was one theory and two politics because people one like theory and two politics. politics. Oh, geez. Yeah. Now we've already talked about theory for forty five minutes. Forty That's minutes. Good. But it, the, the interesting thing, another contradiction, which has, again, I'm not an economist, I'm a philosopher, I, I, I read economics, but my, my field of study is philosophy. Um, but I know that there's debates going on within Marxist economics as to how do we understand what exploitation is. There's a certain group of economists that want to move away from the traditional understanding of exploitation as surplus value that's created and, and, and robbed from uh, from working people. And they point to, again, some of these contradictions, like you've uh, you've already engaged with volume two of, of capital. 
And you know that he's still talking about those agents of circulation and about the unproductive proletariat as being exploited, right? But then in, in volume one, it seems to be quite clear that exploitation is a term that's used to describe the phenomenon of surplus value extraction, right? But if they're unproductive and not creating, which means they're not creating surplus value, right? Or acting as agents of circulation, how can he continue to say that they're exploited? I, that's a tension, right? I, I, I don't know how to respond to that. Um, because if they're not producing surplus value, which is what he holds as the condition for what productive and unproductive is, it doesn't seem like he can continue to say that they're exploited. But we do want to say that they're exploited because they're working class people. So it's do what they've done is like change the definition of what exploitation means away from the more orthodox definition of exploitation is the concept we use to describe the extraction of surplus value. I don't know if that's correct. The Marxist intellectuals. Hey. So like does the extraction of surplus value have to result from the production of material commodities though? Cause so say like, you know, nurses, um, they, they provide services that cost people a ton of money, you know, and that money is funneled to shareholders. Is that money considered surplus value or is it not because of the, you know, because they're not producing a material commodity? I don't think it's the materiality of what they're producing. It's not the materiality of what they're producing that considers that that is to be considered. It does. You don't have to make a tangible object in order to be right. productive, right? So nurses can create surplus value. Then wouldn't that make them productive? It would, right? The question would be, where is the surplus value being created? Like, can can you say that the in certain forms of activity when they're combining different things? in order to use something that they have combined in the process of giving service. When they do that, are they doing the same thing that like a Subway employee is when he mixes all of the ingredients and makes a sandwich, which is a new creation, right? That, that mm -hmm. surplus value. So you could, I guess, make an argument that a portion of their workday is productive and another right. portion unproductive, and therefore yeah. they're creating surplus value. That's true. I mean, and I mean, the work that nurses do is necessary to keep those old people alive, like in nursing homes and stuff. So you could almost consider that a contribution to the means of subsistence. Like that's, mm, you know, something right. that service is almost a commodity. At uh oh. Did Eddie freeze or is that me? Uh oh. We glitched okay, out. Back. There we back. Okay. I, I meant to say the nurse's labor is a part of the necessary social labor. Um, right. So, uh, what was, I had something I wanted to pull up here. But he, um, he would go on to say that like transportation is also necessary, but doesn't create surplus value. <laughs> which right. is I know it's so freaking confusing. <laughs> right. It's, um, it's part of the problem is he never saw this service industry that we have today right like the and and that's something that's resulted i feel like from in in america you know we don't produce a lot here we don't manufacture a lot here which has various you know which happens for various reasons you know we've seen financialization and stuff but part of it is because the means of production um, and technology have advanced to a level where you know we need much less labor than we used to um, to produce everything we need um you know, because the technology is so advanced, the extraction and production technology is so advanced. Um, so it's, you know, created a situation where a lot of people are pushed out of those blue collar workforces into the service industry. And it now makes up a huge portion of the Western economies. Um, and again, that's something Marx never got to see. And if he was alive today, I feel like he would put a lot of investigation into that, you know, it'd be, and it would probably um, force him to write some new stuff about it, I guess, um, update his analysis there. Well, he was seeing it very embryonically. Um, because again, he's, he's writing about this in the late 50s, 60s, 70s, early 70s. Um, there isn't, like what we end up knowing 
at the turn of the century as very consumerist capitalism. It hasn't taken off yet. But he is aware that there is this growing tendency of making larger chunks of the working class unproductive and function just for the sake of serving um, consumption, uh, the consumption of the stuff that's made. So it, yeah, he hadn't seen it yet, but he, he it's weird because he kind of predicted something that he had, that had yet to develop. Um, yeah. And uh, so I, I don't want to be like, he would have been caught off guard because he did right, predict no. it. Yeah, totally. Like he spends a ton of time in Capital Volume 1 talking about how, you know, the development of the means of production throws people out of the workforce, you know, and allows mm -hmm. capitalists to cut their workforce. Like he spends like chapters and chapters talking about that. So this is like a natural development. Those people got to go somewhere. And then, you know, at the beginning of the 19th century or uh, um, 20th century, advertising takes off and um, right. you know, consumer capitalism takes off and you have a much larger need for the service industry and even transport industry. Um, Jacob, you can, I've, I've seen this, <laughs> I've got it pulled up. I've been trying to say that for like 15 minutes, but I haven't been able to get it in. I've got the <laughs> video pulled up so we can watch it. Um, thank you for sending that in. <laughs> we'll watch it. Today. Have... Look, he Vouch made a video that says Fidel Castro begged the USSR to nuke America in parentheses. He was okay. insane. The there, I, I figured out how to like highlight comments to not lose them. Oh, I don't yeah. know if you already know how to do it, but I, it's just by star. pressing the little star. Yeah. So there was one that I had pulled up here. Yeah. Does Marxism separate religion and faith? I don't know if you want to get into that or, or not. Yeah, what I'm do you down. Think? Cause I've said stuff about this too. Um, I've said like um, Marxism and religion are compatible, but you know, what I found is someone raised religious is like, as I've been, you know, read more theory, like what you can't do, I feel like is, you know, believe that class struggle is driven by God, you know, or believe that material conditions and um, allow your analysis of uh, the world and material things you know, to be tainted by belief in the supernatural belief that there's this, you know, extra, um, you know, there's this spiritual force that's driving class struggle or something. I mean, and maybe you disagree, maybe, you know, that can be compatible, but like, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible, um, that's just not compatible with Marxism. You know, if you were to read the Bible in like a fundamentalist way, um, so I feel like in a way it almost does separate. Um, or I mean, that's for me personally, like, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Like faith, I don't, I feel like Marxist analysis isn't based on faith. It's based on looking at the world and, and seeing what's around you. So if you're reading faith into it, you know, you're going to get a skewed, um, skewed understanding of it. And that's probably not what you meant by this this um comment we could come at it from a different angle i'm sure but um i'll let carlos go but that was that's been my experience that's it's such a go ahead it, it's such a difficult um question because i i know what i think the right answer is but i it's not a truth that i care too much to uphold like marx I, th I think faith and religion are incompatible with the sort of materialism that is in Marxism. Um, but I don't know if that matters at the certain stage that it's not something that, it, that I think should be fought against. Like when Bakunin was trying to create an atheist faction in the international, Marx called him an idiot and, and urged for him not to do that. Um, the fight against religion, I don't think it's one that we have to wage. It, it doesn't matter, especially since like religion has played such a big role in the struggle for socialism, an extremely big role. And whether it's in Latin America with liberation theology or in the U.S. with the, the black church um, being one of the most progressive parts of American civil society, um, I don't know if... If it's uh, 
I don't know if the result of that answer, does Marxism separate religion? I first of all, I read the question wrong. Like, would Mar I, in my head, I'm answering, are, are Marxism and religion compatible? Um, the right. brain does that where it takes you to where you want to go. Um, right. So I don't know if the yeah, question I did that too. <laughs> <laughs> and yours doing that reinforced mine wanting to do it. That's the thing. All right. I don't know if it's a it's an answer that matters. Like it's. Uh, I'm fine with like communist parties having like a religious, um, a religious section for like Christian communists or something. I don't have a problem with that. Um, now I, I think that a good way to justify that would be through like fideism, which is the, the sort of religious faith that Kierkegaard um, talks about, which is grounded on a leap. Faith, faith is a fundamentally a leap of faith. If you have reason, uh, for faith, then it's not faith. It's something else, right? In order to have faith, you need to have this leap into the unknown. And insofar as Marxism is a form of science that deals with what is known and making known those things which are relatively unknown, um, maybe you could separate them into two fields. Like faith is this thing that I hold um, through a leap into something that I know there it has no certainty. And because it has no certainty, that's why I can call it faith. And then Marxism is this other thing that does bring me a certain level of certainty because of the validity of its method in investigating the world. So I, I think that fideism would be the, the way to go in order to separate the two. Yeah, I don't know that, now that I think about it, I don't know that Marx talks about faith that much because his analysis of religion is so materialist he's just saying you know what effect does it have on society what effect does it have on the workers you know the workers are alienated so they turn to um, spirituality and religion it's also you know serves as a sense of community for people it's all like you know material stuff how does yeah. know, religion affect the proletariat which i think is what we need to take into account you know and understand uh like you said that like the black churches in the u.s have been like one of the main centers for revolutionary struggle in our entire history, you know, mm -hmm. and we definitely shouldn't just poo poo their religion and, you know, try and combat that. Like it's not worth our time. We should be like, you know, you have your faith, but let's organize to make things better um, here on earth. I, what I was saying earlier is basically like you, um, if you're going to do a Marxist analysis though, you just can't let like your own faith taint what you're doing. You know, mm -hmm. you have to stay material. Um, and sometimes it can be hard to separate those things. Um, uh, if you're someone, you know, who has um, some sort of religious faith. Like, I've, I've seen people say, like, class struggle is driven by God. And I'm, it's like, I don't know. <laughs> That's the way, it, like, class struggle is historical and material. And it's something that happens objectively. Um, but I don't know. Maybe it's all right to think class struggle is driven by God. Um as long as it doesn't draw you to any weird conclusions <laughs> or right, right. conclusions, I guess. It, it's, it's very difficult because, again, like the materialist interpretation of religion is that it arises differently at different points in history because of the differences in context, which require people to develop this realm um, where, um, where they can achieve some form of comfort in a very harsh world. Um, and the essence of what we can find as a critique of religion is that which is not a necessarily a denunciation but more of more so of a sociological understanding of what role does religion play in society um and in that way it goes uh, well beyond Feuerbach, who who was denunciating religion as a the uh, center where an alienation takes place right we have this human essence that we cannot fulfill perfectly. We cannot love, will, and reason uh, perfectly. And therefore, we postulate this God that we alienate our human essence, our species essence into. In critiquing that, Marx is critiquing a way of approaching the question of religion as the question of alienation. And he postulates, no, it's economics, where alienation takes place. And religion is really this deriv 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 derivative thing that um, happens because of this other thing. And so Feuerbach was really seeing things in a topsy-turvy manner. Um, 
so yeah, I, I don't think that the denunciations of religion are necessary um, or fruitful. Like I would, I would argue against that. Um, but a sociological understanding should be should be good. Hmm. I like that. You make a good point that so you know, a major function of philosophy forever has been critiquing religion, which I don't think is a bad thing. Um, but you know, Marx doesn't spend that much time doing it, um, and he actually you know says that no alienation isn't stemming from religion you know it's stemming from production and, and religion is conditioned by production um and it's part of the the superstructure that reinforces the productive base and the productive relations um yeah i don't know if you have anything else to say on that otherwise i have a, a pol political article that we can talk about since we said we we're going to talk about two political things um this is from one of my favorite websites, Venezuela Analysis. They have good theoretical and political analysis. Um, but I meant to send a, a private chat that I, I wanted to take a break because I have to use the restroom. And I put it oh, in the sorry. Go ahead. I'll introduce this. And then when you come back, I'm going to go pee. Sounds good. <laughs> um, so this is from Venezuela Analysis. Uh, I know George Cicciarello Maher writes for them. Um, I'm a big fan of his work, or Mayer. I don't know how you say his last name. Um, but this is something that I'm also going to gonna expound upon in the Venezuela book that I'm doing. Because the, like the names, the U.S. is pretty open about what they're doing in Venezuela. Like You can go on the U.S. government website. You can go on USAID's website. Um, and they'll talk about democracy programs in Venezuela and, and how much money they've spent promoting democracy in Venezuela. And they say it like a brag. Um, but uh, if you look at what the democracy programs actually are on the ground, they're regime change efforts. Um, and how can the U.S. and the State Department brag about how they're spreading democracy and helping people in Venezuela when they're literally killing children with their sanctions every day. Um, so it's the hypocrisy uh, that we always see. And obviously the sanction regime has been going on forever, um, but it's crazy. And, and another thing that they're doing, which, you know, this is kind of a spoiler for the book because um, this is some like uh, research that I did to, and a topic that I haven't seen a lot of people hit on or publish on, um, but they send all this money for migrant programs, migrant settlement programs. Um, and what it really is, is trying to get skilled workers who are necessary for the economy, necessary for producing the means of subsistence in Venezuela to leave, you know, so they'll do migrant programs in Colombia um, and basically offer a bunch of money and benefits for uh, engineers or uh, necessary um, skilled workers in Venezuela to try and sabotage their economy in any way possible. Um, and then, you know, they the U.S. is bragging about this, like, oh, look at the wonderful migration programs we're doing. You know, we're giving money to these immigrants. Aren't we um, so wonderful? Um, when it's designed to sabotage the Venezuelan economy, which is leading to... Um, the death of children as this this article lays out um and then if you if you look deeper into the the migration programs that the u.s is doing which i'm gonna do in the book um or which i've done already i'm gonna write about in the book um a lot of what they're doing is just offering credit for these migrants they're like oh we offered a hundred thousand dollars of credit to any any migrant who would leave venezuela any skilled worker who would leave venezuela and we settled them in colombia but credit is just a loan from a Western bank that they have to pay back with interest. It's like, you're not helping anyone. You're not giving anybody charity. You're debt trapping the entire country of Colombia, or you're luring people who are, you know, sucker enough um, to believe that the U S is helping them out by giving them a hundred thousand dollar loan from a Western bank. Um, so it's just disgusting the way that they, um, they, um, are doing the exact, I mean, they're lying and pretending that they're helping, um, not even pretending to be neutral. They're pretending like they're helping and bringing human rights, um, trying to give off that appearance when, when it's the opposite, the, the programs that are named after human rights are in democracy, um, are designed to destroy, uh, their democracy and strip their people of their sovereignty, uh, economically and politically. So I'll go to the bathroom now. <laughs> Oh, we just got a uh, a super sticker. 
Um, thoughts on Anthony Hudson for president 2024. Um, we'll wait for Eddie to come back to, to cover that so that you get the, uh, the bang for your buck on the super sticker. Um, let's see. I'm looking through the uh, chat. Have you read Matt uh, McManus's piece on Jacobin? Um, which piece are you talking about? I've read some of his work. I know that uh, there's something that's very admirable about him, which is that he's he's willing to dive into the most cringeworthy uh, cons of conservative books and like debunk them. Um, and he's been trying to develop like liberal Marxism, explicitly liberal Marx Marxism, working within the tradition of uh, John Stuart Mill. Um, I, of course, would would not agree with uh, uh, liberal Marxism, but I do think that it's um, it, it takes a certain type of of courage and discipline to be able to read the sorts of books which he reads in order to review and criticize, um, like the American Marxism book that was uh, written by this far right guy. Let me see what if I remember his name. American Marxism. It's such a dumb book, but the and it's a shame that the title is taken. Mark Levine, Mark Levin, Mark R. Levin. It's a shame that the title is taken because that would be like a great title for like a book that genuinely develops what Marxism uh, should or has and, and would look like um, within the context of an analysis of the U.S. Um, but like, I know he reviewed that piece and he's reviewed some other stuff. But uh, I wonder what uh, essay you're talking about. Um, let's see. Oh, the Mark Levine, yeah. Uh, the soul is material being, but it happens to be outside of the five senses. It's not voodoo magic or anything, especially the Islamic Jewish understanding of it. I think that's good. I, I think that there's a category um, of emergentism, which... It would be interesting, I wonder if anyone's written on it, but it would be interesting to analyze like spirituality um, uh, from the category of emergentism, which holds that uh, when things develop into totalities, into wholes, they end up then reciprocally allowing, they, the whole is basically more than the sum of its parts. So the whole can develop abilities that cannot be reduced to the combination of any of the abilities of the parts or to any one individual part in specific. So like ant colonies are able to trace the closest food source to the colony, uh, which is something that an individual ant cannot do. And in neuroscience, the argument is that that's what happens with the brain. You can't pinpoint any specific uh, part of the brain in which you can say, well, this is where thinking comes from, or you can't pinpoint any specific uh, addition of different lumps of the brain where you say this is where thinking comes from it's rather an emergent category a new form of quality that the whole is able to achieve as a whole and i wonder if the category of spirituality or if there's been anything written on how spirituality is a potentially emergent uh quality of human life but we got a super sticker right before right before you left. Yeah, I'm trying to look at this dude, Anthony Hudson, um, and make my analysis of him because I haven't heard of him. I haven't. Uh, I thought it was Michael Hudson. I read Michael Hudson the first time. I did. Anthony Hudson. You're, I mean, isn't Michael Hudson the economist that we love? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I wish Michael Hudson was running for president. That oh, would yeah. be sick. Um, let's see what Anthony's policies are. He looks like he's got the same like aesthetic as Trump. Like they almost yeah. have the same branding. Not that that means anything, but um, the people before politics things. I think it's from the Libertarian Party. Mm. Uh, there's a there's an anti-war rally that's taking place in Washington. I think in in February that the People's Party and the Libertarian Party are are hosting. Um, I've I've seen some of the stuff that they've posted on Twitter, and they're against the. The, the proxy war against Russia. Um, they're again sending a ton of, uh, uh, I think, 100 billion by now, 100 billion of US taxpayer money over to Ukraine funding Nazis. Um, so it's, 
they're pretty good, at least in that field, they're more progressive than the progressives that, uh, quote unquote, progressive socialists that you have in the Democratic Party. But um, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't think I'd ever uh, vote for a libertarian. Yeah. And this guy needs to have his policies on his page. Like, uh, and with libertarians, I agree. I don't think I'd ever vote for them because they're always in favor of dismantling the social safety net and all the good things for workers that we do have because um, they just call it big government. Um, you can work with libertarians on anti-war stuff, you know, or build coalitions uh, against imperialism. Um, but, yeah, I don't know if I would um, say I'd vote for one. This, if you're in touch with an this Anthony Hudson fella, tell him he needs to like bullet point his policies and what he stands for and list them out because he just has these giant chunks of text. Um, it's hard to see what he's really about. And uh, maybe he is a libertarian, but it doesn't look like he has an ideology, which, you know, sometimes these like uh, people over profit folks are like, I'm above ideology, but, but that's kind of ridiculous. You know, <laughs> should understand that everybody has an ideology. Um, and that ideology guides a lot of your thinking or it, you know, um, has to do with the lens that you see the world through. Uh, I mean, he seems like a good guy. Some of his stuff in here seems cool. People over profit. I was blue collar, hardworking man, like all that stuff is good. Um, but I mean, is he running as a third party candidate for president? He's, he has 235 followers. He's probably not going to win. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, power to him i hope he help he spreads um a good message and that's all we can really hope for with electoral bourgeois politics because you know obviously the system is basically designed so that you can't win if you're an actual socialist or actual progressive and even if you do win everything you try and do is going to be held up in the courts and blocked by congress and you know a, a lot of the uh, progressive politicians that people have put their faith in like aoc have just you know soon as they get into Washington, cozy up to Nancy Pelosi and um, the the establishment Democrats and, you know, side with the bourgeoisie. Um, so I uh, got another super chat here. Um, thank you for that, though. Thank you for that super chat and that question. Appreciate it. Um, is Christopher Lash any good? I don't know who that is. Do you know who that is, Carlos? Yes, he was an American philosopher of the middle of the last century. Um I haven't read him directly. I've, we've published like two reviews from a historian that writes for us. That's on Christopher Lash. Uh, the reviews seemed interesting. I haven't uh, read him personally, though, so I can't I can't comment on it. But um, I'd be interested in reading him at some point. Uh, I remember when I read the reviews, I was interested in reading it, but I was just involved in something else. Yeah, I mean, this is just Wikipedia, but it said he sought to use history to demonstrate what he saw as the pervasiveness pervasiveness with which major institutions, public and private, were eroding the competence and independence of families and communities. Latch strove to create a historically informed social criticism that could teach Americans how to deal with rampant consumerism, proletarianization, um, and what he famously labeled the culture of narcissism. So right. I don't know. It kind of sounds like one of these historians who's like uh, getting close, approaching a lot of Marxist ideas um, without embracing Marxism um, and probably adding their own bent to it. But noticing, you know, the alienation in society, the fact that most public and private major public and private institutions are exploiting people and taking away people's independence and sovereignty and um, happiness. And, um, so, I mean, all that sounds good. I'm sure his. I would probably disagree with his conclusions on a lot of stuff. I just, I'm guessing, but the, the thing on the culture of narcissism sounds interesting though. Cause I mean, consumerism and capitalism in its development has created such a, an individualistic society. Um, and, and narcissism is so common. I met so many people who I would classify as narcissists and, you know, when you meet one, you know, it, um, some people are just a little bit selfish. There's people who are a little bit selfish and then there's like, narcissists who literally do not care about anyone but themselves and their ego blinds them um in everything that they do um and they only do things for their own advancement in society but i mean that's the kind of mindset that you're encouraged to have you know just do do whatever it takes to climb the ladder be cutthroat um be mark zuckerberg screw over your friends for money and power and capital um so you know it, it 
the the economic base um, encourages a psychology of narcissism and individualism. So that would be interesting to read. Um, but yeah, I, I, sent you, I sent the article that we've published. Um, it's from Justin Clark. He's a historian. He's written a few articles for us. He's pretty, his writing's really good. And in this article, he analyzes the, um, both the culture of narcissism and then the minimal self, which are his, his two main books. I remember reading it. Uh, that was the one that edited it. It was at the beginning of this year, but I can't remember much of it, but, um, hmm. yeah, I, I think that's all interesting. Uh, and it's very, it's very clearly a problem. So there's a, a, a variety of ways of, of diagnosing it, but it, philosophy, especially at the turn of the century of the last century realizes that something's messed up and that they have to start thinking about what, what's messed up. So you have, uh, and someone like Edmund Husserl, the, the father of uh, phenomenology, you have the idea that there's a crisis in European sciences, um, which is a way of him trying to engage with what's uh, messed up. Science got to a point where um, it's 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 been so completely alienated from human life, and that has constituted a crisis. Uh, if you think about the word crisis, crisis just means split. Um, and, uh, you know, you have other people like Max Scheler, um, who is uh, one of the more prominent German philosophers at the time. We don't really know much about him now, unfortunately, but um, he was uh, going to be one of the people who was going to found the Frankfurt School. And um, he ended up dying right before uh, he was living in Nazi uh, Germany at the time. And he was one of the first people that was a strong anti-fascist from the realm of philosophy. And he said that uh, what's messed up is that we have a culture that's dominated by ressentiment. So he brings in this category from Nietzsche. Um, he reinterprets it though, whereas Nietzsche blames Christianity and slave morality. Um, he ends up uh, saying that, no, it was actually the, the eclecticism that infiltrated Christianity, which led to ressentiment. And he's got some interesting uh, ideas that um, I think in some areas are, are correct. But the point is that you have this, uh, in the US, you have someone like Thorpstein Veblen that uh, begins to criticize within somewhat close to a Marxist fashion, um, the, uh, the culture of conspicuous consumption and conspicuous leisure. Um, and his, his book ends up getting quite uh, popular. Um, so you start to see a bunch of different philosophical ways of theorizing something that is very clear to everyone, which is that there's something that's messed up. You know, people are at, at their core prioritizing things and and uh, things over human beings. And it's this valuative inversion, this uh, um, uh, transvaluation of values where the thing and material tangible objects are put uh, valuatively on top of human beings. And I think that that uh, was already clearly formulated in the young Marx in, in 19, 1844. Um, that's the basis of, uh, of one of the ways that he's thinking about uh, alienation. There's a variety of ways, but um, one of the effects is that things are valued much more than humans. There's a quote that um, the rate at which the valuation of things goes up is proportional to the rate at which human value goes down. Uh, mm -hmm. This is 1844. I mean, fucking six decades before any of the 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 best theorists of the turn of six seven decades before any of the best theorists of the turn of the century begin to theorize problems that Marx was already describing. I think a whole lot more correctly, um, almost a, a a century before. It's interesting. One of the I've never heard that that you know as the valuation of things goes up, people go down. But that's basically the argument I'm making in the Journal of American Socialist Studies too. Um, and using the opioid crisis basically as the evidence of that, like, you know, they knew, they knew it was going to get people addicted. They knew it was going to kill people. And yet they lied about it. They marketed opioids, um, not just to people, but to physicians, you know, so that they could massively increase pres prescriptions um, for, um, for pain and anxiety, opioid prescriptions. Um, they knew the effects that it was going to have and they did it anyway and they lied about it. Not only did they lie about it, but they created this idea that physicians expressing skepticism about this, physicians who were resistant to prescribing these opioids were opiophobic. 
I, I swear to God, this is in the academic literature. Um, so, you know, you see the um, complete valuation of, or putting of um, surplus value and profit and, and material things over human life in the most disgusting way to the point where you have these conglomerates, these shareholders on Wall Street um, who are supposed to be running the healthcare system, who are supposed to be running the system that, that brings people health care and saves their lives. And instead, they're killing 60,000 of them to make billions of dollars. I mean, doing the research on it was truly one of the most disgusting. I mean, it, it shows you how disgusting these people are. Um, and, you know, and no one has been held accountable. No, what? No one has been held accountable to this day for it. Right. I, I mean, there's been like... Uh, like they'll sue Purdue Pharma and they sued a lot of the main companies behind it. But um, like all the shareholders just restructure, right? Like maybe the company will go under, but uh, who's the big family, the the biggest opioid family? Um, uh, they're still one of the richest families in the world, the Sackler family who were the owners of Purdue Pharma. Yeah. Like Purdue Pharma is getting sued and stuff, but that's, you know, they're going to be charged a billion dollars, have to pay a billion dollars in court, and they still have six billion dollars, um, which is something that I write about in, in the journal, which will be coming out real soon. Um, but n absolutely no accountability for just straight murdering 60,000 working class Americans um, for profit. So uh, you... there's no compromising with the bourgeoisie. <laughs> there's no compromising with Wall Street. Uh, they all deserve to burn in hell for eternity. Right. And it, it, the government collaborated with it, too. Um, and when they, there was a movement, because I write about this in every step in of the way. And the, the article academy. That I, Sorry. Right. <laughs> Go ahead. The, the article that um, I was asked to write for uh, this Cuban journal, um, which I was just told that it's going to be featured as a chapter in a book that's printed uh, by a Cuban editorial. Um, I write about this and I cite uh, your piece from from the journal. Um, but it's incredible how the government was so involved to the point that when there were petitions to release the data, the government <laughs> and, and the, the part of the government, the state department that had collected the data was like trying to prevent its release. I'm trying to see if I find the, the part where I talk about that in, in my paper, but it's just absolutely bonkers. And, I mean, none of these people have been held accountable. You're not held accountable when, you know, you you make $7 billion or something off of uh, selling a drug that has killed 70,000 uh, Americans a year, and then you have to pay a billion dollars in, in fines. Like, that's not being held fucking accountable. Like, lock these people up, do more. I mean, I... <laughs> when they send them to the gulags. <laughs> Right. We, like, bring when I was reading about the opioid crisis, I'm like, this makes me want to bring them back. This makes right. me want to throw these the Sackler family in a labor camp. <laughs> they spent forty million dollars giving sixty eight thousand physicians across the U.S. Uh, the drug. So, like, they basically bribed the physicians uh, in order to have them prescribe the drugs. Many under the awareness that it wasn't addictive. Many on the under the awareness that it probably was, but they just chose to ignore it. Right. Um, a lot of physicians just didn't know. They just take the information they get from NGOs, the academy, and the, the hospital systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty insane. Uh, but it's it's the epitome of how far the government, which functions as a committee for the bourgeoisie, is willing to go in order to secure the profits of big business. Um, and and, uh, and part of it happens because of the revolving door, like especially with the academy, people wonder how could the academy be in, complicit in the opioid crisis? Well, I'm studying healthcare administration right now and my <laughs> professors are nice people, but they are former USAID employees, former US State Department employees, you know? So there's this revolving door between hospital systems, um, between uh, for, I mean, healthcare NGOs, um, between government health institutions and then corporations and hospital systems. And they make it like that on purpose. So, you know, all the young uh, future healthcare administrators in my classes are being taught how to maintain the profits of corporations. Um, it's not, they're honest about the problems of the system, but their solutions are, you know, how do we can continue to make profits? Um, so you have, you know, the Academy was pushing this idea um, 
of the need to prescribe opioids for um, pain and addiction. And of course, there was research within the academy that said, you know, this is going to be terrible, but they purposefully suppressed that. And, you know, when most of the, the academics in the field are former USAID employees, like who's really going to bring it up and make a big stink about it? And if you do, they're going to call you opiophobic. And guess what? Pfizer and the Sackler family and all these companies are huge donors to CNN and every fucking media outlet you've ever heard of. So they're going to blast it over um, the media, the means of communication, that you're opiophobic and that you're evil, you know, if you're a physician who doesn't want to get people addicted to fentanyl. Um, And it might sound like I'm getting heated about this, and that's because I am. I hate these bastards, the Sackler family. Um, I hope there's an afterlife so they can go to hell. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you're absolutely right. And and then the... I mean, maybe it's just that a lot of people on the left don't know this, but the more I've researched this, the more absurd it seemed like two years ago when communist groups were like calling people in the Midwest and just workers in the Midwest who were very skeptical of the vaccine, calling them anti-science or or just saying mean things about them because they were skeptical uh, of taking a vaccine that was produced by the same far- pharmaceutical industrial complex that has given us an opioid crisis that's killing 70,000 Americans a year in order for them to continue making billions of dollars and cipher them into the politicians and to the media that continues to either ignore or say that there's nothing wrong. So it's, you know, how can you expect <laughs> people in these regions who have had, everyone knows someone who's been a- addicted to to opioids, how can you expect these people to have trust in medicine after this? How can you expect that? You know, it's it's a point that I bring up that I was just asked to do an article for Science for the People on Cuban healthcare and how the blockade affects Cuban healthcare. But you don't have that sort of distrust in medicine in Cuba because the point of medicine is to cure people. And it, it, beyond that, to be so preventative that the the, the stage of curing people doesn't even get there because you've prevented the health disease from even occurring. It treats medicine, as I've written, as almost self, like the goal of medicine is almost self-abolition, is to destroy the conditions which lead to medicine being necessary in the first place. And Che was writing about this, in, in not writing, but uh, speaking about this in the 1960s in various lectures. It's the opposite of that in the U.S., why the hell would you want when you have a for-profit medical system for a cure to arise or for something to be solved or, or to have preventative health care? That's just the prevention of more profit being realized at a latter point. And so if, if we don't take that into account, what sort of people are we when we condemn people who are skeptical because they've had family members affected by an opioid crisis that was manufactured by big pharma, by the government that was that the academy and the media played a big role in legitimizing and then covering it up. How are we going to blame people for being skeptical? We can't. When we look at all of this, we can't blame them. Yeah. And after studying healthcare administration all these years, I would go as far as to say you should be skeptical. You know, if you look at the research, vaccines have been proven to, you know, slow the spread of COVID. I would argue that, you know, there's legitimate research that the vaccines are good. Now the corporations did everything they could to profit off it and enforce a vaccine apartheid on the global South um, and prevent countries from importing or even manufacturing themselves the vaccine using intellectual property laws. And the only reason they wanted a mandate was to make as much money as possible. Um, So, you know, there are a lot of things to be skeptical of and you got to, you know, look into each case um, on its own. But you should be skeptical. You should, you know, research what the healthcare system is telling you before you put something in your body. Um, Because they've been for, I mean, they've lied to us time and time again. Um, And since the beginning, uh, like in in, um, the Journal of American Social Studies, too, that I'm giving a bunch of spoilers for right now. But, you know, that's the research I've been doing. It, I also try and give a historically materialist develop, or analysis of the development of the pharmaceutical industry. So it emerges at the same time capitalism emerges, these for-profit pharmaceutical conglomerates that um, stem from chemical companies or fertilizer, petrochemical companies. Um, and they really get there or they really start to take off during World War II when there's a need for penicillin um, and, and some other antibiotics for the troops. 
But then after World War II ends, they need to keep their profits high, you know, and, and that's what's considered the golden age of pharmaceuticals. And there is a lot of technological development. There's a lot of new medicines that are invented at that time. But what they start investing most of their money in is marketing. You know, it's the golden age of pharmaceuticals because they, they finish with the war. The war helps establish these companies and then they turn to the American public. They're like, all right, how can we keep our profits high? And, you know, in the process of doing that, they've invented a lot of good life-saving medicine um, for sure. But there's also been things like the opioid crisis. They've also lied to us about medicine. They also use intellectual property laws to stop cheaper generic medicines from being made uh, to prevent and even regress um, technological and medical progress. Um, so you should absolutely be skeptical of them. You shouldn't, you know, Honestly, I'm, I'm sorry if this makes people anxious, but you shouldn't just trust your doctor because a lot of physicians are just, um, as we found with studying the opioid crisis, a lot of them are just um, listening to what they're told by NGOs or by the academy that's run by USAID or um, by pharmaceutical corporations or hospital systems themselves. And, and the hospital systems are oftentimes you know, conglomerated now with insurance companies, with um, pharmaceutical companies. So it's all just a bunch of shareholders um, at the top uh, basically controlling the entire thing. So, you know, be skeptical of them. Don't trust them, please. Um, not, I mean, medicine is, can help and you don't need to be against modern medicine, but, um, <laughs> be skeptical of it. Uh, we got another super chat, by the way. Um, just real quick. I don't know anything about Sam Marcy, but go ahead. It's just, uh, it, it's, it's insane that communists were able when this whole Uyghur thing came up, and I guess it's still around, uh, this old bullshit uh, Uyghur genocide accusations that are, uh, they have no ground. It it's was wonderful. funny how they're going away, though. Right, like right. the State Department is giving up on it. Oh, maybe the genocide's not happening. But. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it was first genocide, then cultural genocide, and then, yeah, maybe there's no evidence for this. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's crazy how we could say, look at what they've done all over the Middle East. Now tell me if they really give a shit about Muslim minorities. And then people could be like, oh, well, yeah, that's true. What, what's the ulterior motive here? Let me investigate that. And uh, is that driving the propaganda that I'm seeing on TV? Why can't the same be done with healthcare? Look at these other things that they've done. Why would you think that it's irrational for people who have been personally affected by these other things in healthcare uh, to have a lack of trust in a society that says that they wanted to promote X, Y, or Z uh, treatment in order to uh, meet the public good, but who in reality has let a million fucking people die from COVID. Like, what public good are you serving? And why is it irrational for people who know that these are not the people who do anything for public good? They do everything for a buck. And if public good comes about it, it's a latent effect. It's, oh, wow, great, um, it happened, but that's not really the thing we're trying to do. I don't think it's irrational for, for, for people to have that skepticism. And that's something that it doesn't even make sense in Cuba. Like in Cuba, it wouldn't make sense doubting the intentions of medicine because it's so clearly to help people. But here it's, it's very sad, but the more you look into it, the more you study, you're like, what the hell? I, I, published an article earlier this year for Science for the People on serotonin. And it was the same thing. So much fucking money went into promoting the idea that depression is a result of chemical imbalances in the brain, for which we magically have this beautiful pill for that the more advertisement we put out, the more things it helps with. It's a fucking almost $25 billion industry. It's a massive industry. And, you know, you see it in one field and then you see it with the opioids. And the more you study, the more you're probably going to see it. It's not irrational to doubt and it's not anti-science. I would say it's in the spirit of science to, to question science that's led by the profit incentive. And the, the articles, like I had chronic illness as a kid and, and Lyme disease. And I could tell even as a kid going from doctor to doctor. Uh, I don't talk about this a lot, but going from doctor to doctor, I could tell there were different opinions between all the doctors on Lyme disease. Uh, 
Oh, oh. Is it me who's frozen? Is it Eddie? My signal seems to be fine. Eduardo. Is he frozen or is it me? What's up, chat? Who's frozen? Eddie's frozen. Okay. Darn it. Um, someone mentioned here, Cuba has a lung cancer vaccine. Yes, they have a lung can cancer vaccine. They also have other things that are, uh, studies have been shown that they're really, really good for treating various forms of cancer. Um, they also have a diabetes um, treatment that cuts down the uh, potential for amputation by half. And when you look at what ends up happening after people end up needing an amputation, um, I think like 60% of them die within five years and 80% of them die within 80 years. So uh, the, the reason why we don't have both the lung cancer vaccine and the other cancer vaccines and uh, the uh, di diabetes treatment is because of the blockade. So it's not just the case that the blockade is affecting Cuban medicine, which of course it is. It prevents them from getting um, tools and medicines and a variety of different things that are necessary for the healthcare system. It also affects Americans um, because there's approximately like at 60, at, with the case of diabetes, there's 60,000 Americans who would be prevented in am amputation statistically if they had that Cuban treatment and who will not be uh, getting that uh, potential prevented amputation and therefore dying within five to 10 years because they don't have that. So when you take into account lung cancer and the other vaccines, there's somewhere near to 100,000 Americans that die a year because they don't have medicine uh, or, or that are potentially going to die in the near future because they don't have medicine that has been developed in Cuba because of the blockade. Hmm. I, all I was saying uh, earlier before I got cut off there, before my Wi-Fi died, was um, I had to do a literature review summarizing all the academic peer-reviewed literature on the condition that I was diagnosed with, you know, and I learned a lot from that and, you know, learned a lot about where my doctors were coming from. And, you know, the more I read, the more I disagreed with a lot of the, the physicians and their way of going about it. But um, you can do, like, all that medical literature is there if you want to do the research yourself, if you're motivated, you know, um, like if you get um, if you get prescribed something and you're skeptical about it or diagnosed with something like you can do a lot of research yourself. I know someone said the average um, doctor knows more than the average person, like listen to your doctor. I mean, that's such a simplistic way to look at it. I mean, yeah, the average doctor knows more. You should take your doctor's advice, you know, into account, but you can, you can still do your own research, right? You can still be skeptical. You can still ask questions, you know, and understand that, you know, um, you may not know as much as your doctor, but also your doctor may be influenced by the, um, you know, by corporations. They may be influenced by NGOs. You know, the physicians may just not be questioning what they're doing because they don't want to get attacked as being opiophobic and all of a sudden be at the center of all this controversy and potentially losing their job, which is what we know the um, pharmaceutical corporations were doing on purpose now, um, smearing people as opiophobic. Um, you know, the, a lot of these doctors just want to do their job. So they're just going to kind of um, do what what they're told. Um, so Pedro Mio wants to know if you could continue with the, the Lyme disease uh, story. So I, that I was, I mean, that's what I was saying I, I mean i had to do a literature review on lime and like i don't know um there's there's not a lot we know um about chronic lime and there's a lot of doctors who think it's like essentially not real um they'll basically say that like all your can your all the symptoms are subjective but there's been a growing number of people with lime a huge percentage of them like 90% of them are people who got Lyme disease and tested positive for it. Like got bit by a tick, got traditional Lyme disease, had it treated with medication. Maybe I'll post my literature review on Midwestern Marx. Maybe we should publish it because it's, you know, it's not explicitly Marxist, but it is probably worth reading. Um, but 
you know, and the number of people with Lyme is growing. It's concentrated in within certain populations within um, especially the Midwest and anywhere where there's the deer tick, which is known to carry Lyme. But there's a distinction between Lyme disease and, and chronic Lyme. And a lot of doctors are saying the, the 500,000 people, the growing number of people whose conditions are chronic, I mean, whose symptoms are chronic or whose symptoms go away after being treated, but then come back. You know, they basically say those people are faking it because because there's no real um, treatment with medicine. Right. The, the treatment that works for people with chronic Lyme is like um, therapy, nutrition, exercise, you know, putting yourself in a better environment. That doesn't make them any money. Um, so they're basically like, oh, well, it's not real. I mean, that's my interpretation after doing the literature review and having the condition and going to a million different doctors. Um, but um, yeah, they can't sell you a pill for it. They don't care. And, you know, I, I made that argument even to one of my like pro you say liberal professors, like they're saying that people are faking it because they can't make any money off. And she was like, you right. So <laughs> should we talk about we should probably answer this super chat. I don't know much about Sam Marcy. I know Maupin did a video about him once. Um, I don't know if you know anything. I do not. I tendency, I believe. Well, I, yeah, I, um, I know that there was, there was traditionally anti mopping people who were sharing his Marxism article positively. Um, I didn't read it though. So I, I can't really comment on, and I, I don't know what Marxism is. I think it's the, uh, from what I've heard, it's the, one of the tendencies behind, uh, uh, the PSL, um, back when, uh, before it became the PSL when it was the workers, the workers world uh, party, but I can't, I can't really uh, comment on it. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you for the super chat, but I don't want to, I just don't want to spout off about something I don't really understand. Um, so I found the, the quote that I mentioned earlier. I don't know if you want me to read it. We had such a long yeah. interview in the middle. Um, so this is from the manuscripts of uh, 84 uh, with the increasing value of the world of things proceeds in direct proportion the devaluation of the world of men. Um, today, you know, the, the PC uh, language, we say the world of people but, uh, or the human world. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, we have come to value things more and more and more and people less and less and less. For sure. I like that. You might have to send me that quote because I uh, might end up using it. Um, I just... Uh... I was looking at some news stories. Did you see that? Um, oops, I got to reshare my screen. It left me when I when my Wi-Fi went down. Um, but the U.S. authorized drone attacks against Russia, which I saw. I mean, I, I guess I'm talking about TikTok, so take it with a grain of salt. And it was Philip DeFranco who was huge on TikTok. But in the same video, he said that the U.S. isn't waging a proxy war against Russia. Um, and then he announced that the U.S. was allowing for drone strikes against Russia um, and talking about how this is such a great thing. because This is going to allow us to defend Ukraine. So now the U.S. is officially launching missiles, launching strikes at another nuclear power. Um, the, and th as this article says, they're going further and further into Russian territory, provoking Russia more and more. And the U.S. is just insane, psychopathic um, proxy war against another nuclear power that you know is is risking or pushing us closer to an absolute human rights disaster um nuclear warfare um russia said that falling wreckage from ukrainian drone killed three servicemen at a base 300 miles from ukraine which would be the third such long-range attack this month launching drone strikes into russia the u.s isn't waging a proxy war though this is for the defense of Ukraine. You know, we got to launch strikes into Russia and destroy the entire country of Russia. Um, to it's just defend Ukraine. It's just it has to be willful ignorance at this point, and because um, there's so much evidence to show that one, this is a proxy war, and two, that there could be a very good argument that this is a defensive war from Russia's side. Because as we saw with the recent uh, spoutings of Angela Merkel, from the beginning of the Minsk agreements, they knew that they were not going to fulfill it, and that the whole fucking purpose of the Minsk agreements 
was to give them time in order to build up Ukraine militarily in order to wage the war that they've been wanting to wage. It's been inevitable for the West to wage a war militarily against Russia. So who is, of, oh, sorry. Who's on the defensive? It's kind of insane. To, like, I know the American public is brainwashed, but the fact that there's still so much public support for the war, and maybe it is dwindling, but with the reports that have come out of Europe, with the report of Merkel, like you said, shocking that they were never going to follow Minsk in the first place, and then the report about Boris Johnson, that Ukraine and Russia were moving towards a peace deal. They were moving towards a peace settlement. They were moving towards meeting and getting this war, this horrific bloodshed ended. And Boris Johnson went to Zelensky and said, no, NATO doesn't want you to appease Putin. We want to pressure Putin. You know, in other words, as Scott Ritter says, pushing the Ukrainian people at gunpoint into the Russian military, saying, no, you cannot do a peace agreement. The U.S. wants you to wage a proxy war, no matter how many of your civilians it kills which is why it's so ironic that there are American liberals acting like they're the great defenders of Ukraine, like Philip DeFranco, while they cheer on the U.S. launching drones at Russia, because this is going to lead to way more Ukrainian deaths. You know, and, and Russia, as Scott Ritter's been saying with his excellent analysis lately, they're getting more and more tired of this. Their troops are tired of fighting this war. So a few months ago, Russia made the decision, we're going to start hitting Ukrainian infrastructure. You know, we're going to start hitting Ukrainian power plants and stuff. It's because, you know, the U.S. continues to escalate. They were getting close to a peace settlement. And the U.S. sent Boris Johnson to break it up. So they're saying, OK, you know, you're going to continue this proxy war. You're going to continue to kill Russians and Ukrainians, um, you know, way across the world um, on a, on a landmass that's not even close to, to the U.S. Um, fine. You know, we're going to escalate our tactics, too. And, you know, how much do we escalate until we get to the, the point of nuclear war? And another video I made on TikTok, um, I'm hammering Philip DeFranco because he's one of the main, most popular people covering this on TikTok. Um, he was telling people in the comments, this is not an escalation. The U.S. starting to launch drone strikes to Ukraine. It's like, it's not an escalation. It's self-defense. Like, how, uh, like, not even buyers, how stupid are you? Like, even if you're the most pro-Ukraine, pro-NATO, anti-Russian person in the world, from a military perspective, it's still an escalation. It's an escalation. The U.S. was not launching drones at Russia. Now they are. But these people are so ideological in their liberalism, um, and they're so obsessed with framing this as, as Russia, as these evil aggressors, um, that the U.S. can start launching drones at Russian people, and they're like, nope, not even an escalation. Like you, you people are out of your mind and you're pushing us towards nuclear annihilation. I, I put a tweet out um, a few weeks ago that kind of went viral, which is something along the lines of there's going to be so many dissertations in 30 years about how it was that liberals went from being anti-war to being the, 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 the biggest champions of, of a potentially planned and annihilating, life annihilating uh, third world war. Um, it's just, it's, it's insane. And I, it's grounded in this long culturally inherited anti-Russia propaganda that gets extremely intensified in the years that Trump is in office. And that's when it really starts to get liberals. It had been getting, you know, uh, certain people here and there, but it really gets to liberals, um, with the whole Russian collusion BS. Um, and considering their Trump derangement syndrome, I, I think that that's where like the anti-Russian sentiment begins to just explode that creates then the ideological conditions so that the ruling class would be comfortable in waging a third world war against a nuclear power that can potentially annihilate life on the planet, or at least life as we know it, and liberals would just be like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's because they've been indoctrinated for, they were indoctrinated against Russia for four straight years because they see it responsible as, uh, they see it as the reason why they have the thing they hate the most in this world, which is Trump, because of his mean tweets. Um, and the mean ways he refers to the kids that are still in fucking cages at the border. I mean, so it's, it's, a, uh, it's, uh, you have to tip your hat off to propaganda because all the facts point to them just having to be completely delusional 
to accept the things that they're accepting. And there is a, a level of delusion because you present them facts and what do they say? That's propaganda. Putin probably that's, a, that's a conspiracy. You show them the articles from Western mainstream media from 2014, 2015, from before that, when they're looking at the Azov Battalion and they're saying these, these guys are Nazi. <laughs> There's a neo-Nazi problem in Ukraine. You show them those articles and they're like, that's Putin propaganda. You can't. How do you debate when facts themselves are not accepted? Hmm. You, can't, you can't even make an argument because the premise of their reasoning and conclusions is the complete rejection of facts. They reject every fact which points to the truth, which is that this is a proxy war that's being waged on Russia by the U.S. and NATO. That it's, they've said it. Angela Merkel's just said it a few weeks ago that they knew that they got into the Minsk agreements with the purpose of ignoring it for the sake of buying time to build up the armaments of Ukraine to wage a war against Russia. It's, you have liberals who have admitted it's a proxy war. And you have like liberals in positions of power, people in positions of power who have said stuff like this, we're going to turn Ukraine into a big Israel. But then you'll talk to these liberal ideologues or you'll hear these liberal ideologues like DeFranco and they'll be like, no, it's still not a proxy war. Like your own leaders of your own beloved Democratic Party are the ones saying it's a proxy war. They've admitted it, you know, but you're so... Um, you're so fucking blind on this issue um, or you're just so, um, so committed to lying to people um, that you can't accept basic facts. You can't accept things that have come straight from the horse's mouth. I mean, I share this article all the time. How can you deny this? You know, this is the Atlantic council. This is like a military industrial complex think tank. You know, the Atlantic council pretty much publishes whatever the main weapons manufacturers are thinking. They want to turn Ukraine into a big Israel. And someone said earlier, the, the war is like a um, reasserting of Western or American values on the global stage. And I mean, this shows it more than anything, right? They're like we have this colonial outpost that is Israel in the Middle East that helps us attack Iran and Syria and all the countries we dislike over there. And, you know, now Europe wants to move away from the West. You know, Europe wants to do what, you know or Russia's becoming a, a similar country to Iran, uh, not a socialist country, but a country who says F you to the West and uh, does their own thing with their economic system and with their foreign policy. All right, we're going to turn Ukraine into an Israel so we can attack you with drones whenever we want, um, which is exactly what they're doing. And who knows how long they're going to try and extend this war. They'd like to extend it forever because, you know, what is Israel? Israel's constantly launching missiles at Syria. Mo uh Mossad is constantly doing assassinations um, in Iran, um, and they're constantly provoking the U.S.'s enemies. It's a state of constant warfare, and, and they're not even touching on what they're doing to the Palestinians. Um, so it's literally a state that's in constant warfare that makes the military-industrial complex $3.8 billion a year. And now they want to do the same thing um, with Ukraine, and you have leftists cheering it on. Um, so it, it's wild, and it shows the you know, the state of the American left in a lot of ways um, and, and how we have a lot of. And I mean, also, though, things have gotten better, I feel like, than they were a few years ago. Like um, there are there is, you know, a more tangible, more visible anti-imperialist socialist left now um, than there were was a few years ago, I think, um, where it felt like, you know, if you ever met a communist, they were an anarcho-communist or a Trotskyite um, at best. And, you know, now there's a lot of explicit Marxist Leninists who are advocating multipolarity and all these things. So, but, you know, that's, that's wonderful. And it's really good. And it's the base for something really good. But we're talking about a very small portion of the American population getting better. Whereas a really big chunk has just been getting worse. Mm. <laughs> and, and it's, it's, it's been a shit show. Every single major institution is completely in favor of this proxy war. Every single journal, every everything has been done over the last, since February, to justify the elevating of this crisis into a potential nuclear Armageddon. 
It's and wild. It's, it's 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 bonkers, and and people just they just don't care. They don't care. They don't unless unless they're people who are want to cheer on um, cheer on Ukraine, even though, like I said, they're cheering on the U.S. and NATO, um, pushing uh, Ukrainian people to their deaths. Right. Um, so if you got a Ukraine flag in your bio, you're not pro Ukraine. You're pro um, NATO forcing the death of Ukrainians. And I mean, the war it's gotten so ridiculous ideologically that you now have the Azov battalion, these neo-Nazis visiting Israel, <laughs> you know, there was an SS symbol. group. Sorry, go ahead. There was an SS symbol on the Ukrainian flag uh, when Zelensky oh. visited. Where's that being reported? Besides a few out outlets on the left, where the hell's that being a fucking SS symbol in a flag in Congress? In U.S. Congress. And Kamala Harris and Pelosi are holding it up and clapping. It's, I mean, it, it was one of those surreal moments. Um, similar, it reminded me to Pelosi going, Slava Ukraini. And then you look up the origins of that slogan or like uh, the video that Kayla did and you find out it's, you know, it was a Nazi slogan. It was Ukrainian nationalist slogan. And, you know, now that that's been brought to light, corporate media has, you know, dumped a bunch of articles on it and called it Putin propaganda. So if you Google Slava Ukraini, it'll be like, you know, it's a conspiracy that it originated with Bandera. It, it originated with the Ukrainian nationalists in 1935. Bandera didn't take power till a few years later. It's still a Nazi slogan, you guys. It's still a Nazi slogan being shouted by Nancy Pelosi, a major U.S. leader who's funneling millions of dollars to literal Nazis. That's like saying blood and soil was actually in the theory of this guy who was writing in 1912 Germany. It's like, I don't give a shit. Who used blood and soil as their fucking slogan? Right. <laughs> Change your slogan if you're not nationalist then. <laughs> It's yeah, it's uh, it's surreal, and I, I think that one of the most absurd parts of it is that there's still people that think that that's the party that can fight against fascism in the U.S. The party, get this, the party holding up a flag with the SS symbol, is the party that is going to beat the fascist threat. <laughs> you couldn't make this up. If you made it up, they'd be like, nah, that's too dumb. They're not going to believe it. Like If you were trying to write a script and you said, you know, this is how I'm trying to paint X actor within X, X movement, they'd be like, don't do that. You know, that's very clearly, it's not going to work. It's too on the face. But it's there. People still think the Democratic Party holding up a flag with the SS symbol, sending 100 billions to Nazis, is an anti-fascist party. It, I was gonna say it sounds like a stand-up comedy routine when you said it's a. <laughs> um, when you said it sounds like a script, it literally does. It sounds like you could, like if you reworked that and you know created a setup and a punchline, you could turn that into a stand-up comedy, like a joke. You know that you have these these people claiming to be anti-fascist, like Pelosi, while holding up the SS symbol and yelling fascist slogans, um, or or the idea that you know Pelosi's party is gonna be the one to defeat fascism. Um, or even like the AOCs, you know, and, and historically, social Democrats have always been the accomplices of fascism. You know, they'll uphold social, I mean, uh, bourgeois democracy, which, you know, fascism is a lot of times where bourgeois democracy or capitalism and decay goes. Um, they'll side with the, the fascists over the um, over the communists or over the socialists. And you're seeing a very similar thing with you know, AOC and the whole squad who's like, no, we got to vote to send millions to Ukraine. You know, this this check for the military industrial complex. It's once again, um, social Democrats or progressives siding with literal fascists. They preach socialism and they practice fascism. It's that I mean. It's uh, even the. Even the social democrats from the turn of the century weren't that bad. Like the second international social democrats weren't as bad as the ones that we have here now. And that's why, you know, even to talk about a left in the political arena in the US, it's just like, who's left? These people haven't fought for Medicare for all. They voted in favor of imposing a bill that rejected 
any semblance of, of democracy, the working class, the rail workers voted against the bill that was imposed on them and they, they voted to impose it. And they want to continue fashioning themselves as the party that's trying to save democracy. Democracies for whom is the question, of course, that is never asked. They voted to send $100 billion to Ukraine. They have voted in favor of funding the Iron Dome. I mean, they continue to vote in favor of the security state, of expanding the IRS, of expanding the FBI and the CIA. They continue to say that, you know, Venezuela's this and, 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 and China's this and, and the Uyghur this and the Uyghur that. So what, the, what, what left are you talking about? Who's left here? <laughs> do you do you remember force the vote? I like I was kind of also surrounded by a lot of like middle class liberals at the time that I've since gotten away from and kind of understood, you know, how much of a lost cause the the social democrats or the the progressive AOC style um, justice democrat movement is in the U.S. But I couldn't even like I didn't even believe it. I didn't believe what was going on. So I was like, you know. Um, yeah, you know, I wish they would have gone and, and done force the vote, but it might have been a waste of political capital because they didn't have the votes to potentially get it through. And then you explained to me, no, like they they literally could have. They literally could have forced a Medicare for all vote and and potentially, you know, use their political leverage to actually get it passed. But they refused to do it. And they're like, oh, we can't waste our political capital. Like we voted for you and donated for you because you're donated to you because you said you were going to bust things up in Washington. You know, you said you were going to break up the establishment and cause a ruckus and fight. That's what we want to see. You know, and you're immediately caving and then lying about it. You know, lying and telling people who bought it, like me, that, you know, they there was no um, strategic value to force the vote when, in fact, there absolutely was. And I couldn't even believe what you were telling me. I had to look it up and it blew my mind, you know, um, when I saw that you were right. Um, and... Um, yeah, I, I had something else to say, but it slipped my like, mind. Cause, uh, there's no excuse either. Like some people are like, you know, they act like that because the Democratic Party then gives concessions that they can give to their people locally. No. No. We know the people locally. They're not fucking enjoying the fruits of AOC voting to fund Nazis. I'm sorry. And if they are, maybe those fruits shouldn't be there. I mean, I... <laughs> what? Who cares? So what if they give you maybe a hundred bucks more uh, and a uh, hundred billion to Nazis? I mean, what? <laughs> really? Um, it's not true, but there's no argument that, that, that you can make to make that justifiable. And there's a smidge of hope in the fact that quite a few DSA caucuses have sent letters um, urging the DSA National Political Committee to throw them out of the party. I mean, out of the organization, out of DSA, for uh, for the vote on the rail, uh, um, uh, uh, for the rail vote for the contract. Let's see if there's anything, any change of substance. From what I've heard within people in DSA, the way that it functions is that you have this sort of PMC socialist energy that's channeled into campaigns, into the Democratic Party, and when those win, the people that functioned as the activists get subsumed into the campaign and they just become a part of the Democratic Party and they can't criticize the people who they're getting a paycheck from. Their survival depends on them not criticizing their boss who now becomes the person that won the election. So instead of like the DSA functioning as this organ which moves the Democratic Party, reforms the, the Democratic Party to the left, um, what, it, what ends up happening is that the Democratic Party just absorbs any of the energy that ends up quote unquote succeeding in the electoral arena that's uh, that, that's from DSA. So it's the opposite of what they intended to happen is what's happening. Absolutely. I, that's a, a great point. Um, shout out to those, uh, the class. Um, what's the name of the DSA guys we've been, or the DSA coalition we've been talking to? Class Unity. Class Unity, yeah. And I remembered what I was going to say. I, and I followed AOC specifically more than the rest of the squad because um, I heavily supported her campaign. I was a fan of Kyle Kalinske and the Justice Democrat strategy um, at the time that I was first getting into like uh, um, left wing politics or social democratic politics. And it's like the the more that AOC gets criticized for this, this stuff and the more that she refuses to fight for working people and anything economically and do things like force the vote, um, <clears throat> attack the 
um, financial oligarchy um, and the, the democratic higher ups that make it up, the more she just steers into identity politics, right? The more she just pretends like she's this revolutionary or she's shaking things up um, because, you know, people are sexist to her um, or people make racist remarks towards her. And, and I mean, that's true. Like people do, but then AOC will use that anytime, you know, people criticize her, like with the force the vote thing. Like, oh, this is just misogyny. Like, no, we just want health care. <laughs> we just want health care. And it's almost disgusting to hear her talk now and act as if she's like some sort of revolutionary figure, right? Simply because of her identity traits. Um, it's incredible. While, while fighting for nothing economically. Well, trying to do nothing for the working class, you know, saying I'm busting things up. I'm breaking the glass ceiling. I'm really changing things in Washington because of my identity. Like Nancy Pelosi's a woman. She's still an imperialist. Hillary Clinton, you know, there are plenty of um, LGBTQ uh, politicians who um, are pro-military industrial complex and anti-working class. Like your your identity does not mean you're busting things up. You know, the the system has evolved now to the point where. You know, you can be an imperialist regardless of your identity. And they'll, the CIA will actually use your identity to try and, you know, promote imperialism um, with their sort of woke recruitment ads. Uh, That's why they they need the bigots. They need the bigots to be there because insofar as the bigots continue to be there, they can point to something to say, this is why I'm more progressive. Good point. It's just, it's, there I, there, you said it perfectly. The, the more, that she capitulates to the Democratic Party the more she moves towards identity politics. And the more the critiques that come from the left, she can shift towards, oh, no, it's just because of this. But insofar as she continues to get actual bigoted uh, sexist critiques from the right, she can mix all of them together and present to you some form of, some form of shit cake that has a little bit of actual misogyny from maybe the right and not from the left-wing critiques. Um, so they, they, they need that to continue. And, and that's why it's important to realize that the both both parties need each other. The Democrats don't want to destroy the MAGA movement or the, the, the Republican Party. They're funding it. We know this. They're funding the most, quote unquote, right wing parts of the Republican Party because they need it. They need it in order to continue promoting a program that has no substance, that is fundamentally no different from the Republican Party that's going to prioritize big business, that's going to prioritize finance capital, the deep state. That's what they want. They want to continue perpetuating that. And they can't do that if the Republican Party out of nowhere just gets woke. And it's it's this shows too why it's important to not only understand, you know, woke imperialism, but the mirror of wokeism, as Hans George Muller calls it. Um, like there, there is like an emergent trend on the left now of people who just think, you know, being anti-imperialist and being anti-capitalist means just opposing wokeism period. And they end up just fighting these culture war battles on the opposite side of liberals the whole time. Um, and a lot of them end up in like bigoted or misogynistic positions. And that allows these social democratic politicians like AOC to point and say, look, you know, all the attacks coming at me are from these misogynists are from these bigots. Um, so it's, it's not that we shouldn't analyze culture, um, but, you know, Marxists should not should be fighting uh, for the class struggle. You know, we should be fighting for the working class, not basing all of our politics off wokeism, which there's a huge percentage of people doing now. I mean, huge in terms of like American Marxists, which is a small group of people. Um, but there's like this emergent trend <clears throat> like we have to call out the culture war for what it is, call out wokeism and um anti-wokeism uh, for what they are, you know, distractions from the class struggle. Someone said Afro man, 2024. Thank God. Yes. That's, uh, I, mean, I, that's I might be able to sing the entire Colt 45 song right now off the top. <laughs> Colt 45, two zigzags. Maybe that's all we need. We can go to the park after dark, smoke that tumbleweed. I'm going to get banned if I finish that song. <laughs> <laughs> As a marijuana burn, we can take our turn singing them dirty rap songs. Stop hey, playing the song. Gonna... Stealing tapes from here to Hong Kong. So roll. roll. <laughs> Sorry, what were you saying? 
A AOC was going to uh, fight for Medicare for all until she got high. <laughs> <laughs> she should come out with a video. That would be another. That would be liberal. You know, fight. That would, for be, like, uh, that, that would be a good critical video, right? Where you just take someone to dress up like AOC, and you say, "I was going to fight for Medicare for all, and then I got high. I was going <laughs> to fight for debt cancellation for students, and then I got high." And then I got high, and then I got high. <laughs> Maybe we should do that. Like, do you think Kayla Kayla Pop looks close enough to AOC to like play her in a parody music video? Maybe I'm or, sure she or would. Or would she be down? <laughs> She'd probably be down. <laughs> Someone asked, "Will I ever show videos of you wrestling?" I usually do that at intermission. Um, if I'm doing solo streams, when I go pee, I show videos of me wrestling. I mean, you can just Google me. Um, right now, I'm locked out of a, my matches from college but I'm getting those back um, soon. So, What do you mean you're locked out of your matches from college? Well, they were on this account um, at, at the old school uh, at, mm. at Loris. Um, so, um, yeah, I can't get into them anymore, but my brother still wrestles there, so I'm going to get my matches and just download them so I no longer have to log on to their website. I thought they were on YouTube. Yeah, uh, yeah, the ones of me wrestling at the senior level are like the world trials and stuff. But like half of those are losses because everyone I'm wrestling is good as shit. Versus if I go to my matches from college, you know, there's a bunch of like more fun matches to watch me beating up lesser opposition. <laughs> nice. Um, do you have anything else you wanted to cover today? Do you want to watch the Vouch video? <laughs> yeah, sure. How long is it? Uh, it's eight minutes. We don't have to watch the whole thing. Well, someone uh, brought this up. I did the favorite thing. Uh, if we can oh, nice. talk about Miles on practice and on contradiction for his birthday. Yeah. Um, we're two hours in. I don't know. Would you want to do that? Uh, or do you want to watch the Vouch uh, video? Honestly, I would rather um, talk about Mao. I feel like that's more uh, um, substantive. And we, I'll just save this Vouch video for a rainy day. And I'll whip it out when the views are low. <laughs> Because we know those uh, vouch videos, debate videos, always do well. Okay, yeah. Um, I think both of these essays are written the same year. I believe it's 37, 1937 or 38. Um, they're wonderful. I think they're, they're two of the texts that extend uh, the analysis of dialectical materialism uh, most fruitfully beyond... Um, where it was specifically on contradiction because you have the introduction of three new sets of categories antagonistic versus non-antagonistic contradiction this was already in lenin who argues that uh in socialism antagonisms are abolished but not contradictions that presupposes an understanding of antagonistic contradiction he never develops it though it's it's mao who develops antagonistic versus non-antagonistic first then he develops principle and non-principle contradiction which is a new uh, way of looking at things. The way he theorized it was that we know the universality of contradiction, uh, which means the basic uh, first, most primary dialectical law of the unity and struggle of opposites. Now let's concretize that a little bit. And his uh, concretization took the form of developing the particularities of contradiction. And here's the category of, of principle and, and non-principle contradiction. Uh, and then he takes that even further and he looks at, well, what, what's, what's a contradiction? A contradiction is a unity of opposites. Um, a, 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 the fact that every process and everything is contained, uh, it contains two opposing poles. And what he's going to say is that there's a principal aspect and a non-principal aspect. So in every opposition, there's something that's primary. There's something that's not primary. And those three categorical developments, antagonism and contradiction, principle and non-principle and principle aspect and non-principle aspect of contradictions, I think are the most substantive extension of dialectical materialism that we get in the 20th century. And then on practice is a wonderful text for thinking about Marxist epistemology. So Marxist, the Marxist theory of knowledge, how do we come to know the world? Well, there's this constant dialectical relationship between practice and theory. You test theory and practice and then you go back to the drawing board and it's it's a back and forth that's 
Um, in that way, it's very similar to, to pragmatism and, and what Dewey developed as immediate empiricism. And we know Dewey was in China in the first, uh, in the first few years of the 20th century. And he was very popular. One of the people that was developing uh, what's known, the, the movement before the CPC is founded, it's known as the New Culture uh, Movement. One of the main theorists uh, was a student of Dewey, I believe in Colombia, um, and who he brought Dewey um, to China around the same time as the, the May 4th uh, movement. So there's there's some uh, commonalities. Like when I teach, I, I, I um, in my syllabus, I have people reading the same week Dewey's essay on immediate empiricism and Mao's um, Where Do Correct Ideas Come From? Which is a Where Do Correct Ideas Come From? It's like a really shortened version of the essence of on practice. Um, but yeah, Mao to me is perhaps the most creative developer of dialectical materialism in the 20th century. Hmm. This might be an interesting <coughs> contrast because uh, obviously you've deeply studied your Hegel, um, Hegel and my Wisconsin accent um, as always. But, and, and I'm working on it, but I'm, you know, I'm like, uh, I don't know, 50 pages into lectures on the history of philosophy. So I'm definitely not um, far, well, I'm farther than 50 pages. Good for me. I'm on like page 54, um, but I'm far from being a, a Hegelian scholar. Um, but I feel like Mao's on contradiction for someone trying to understand dialectics and trying to understand, you know, Marx's take on Hegel and, and the stuff Marx was taking from Hegel and, and the, the Marxist conception of dialectics. Like nothing beats his book. Um, and it was a book literally written for peasants who were like just learning to read or, or maybe had, you know, very little education. It's so simple and easy to understand, you know, at least uh, related to how complex the topic itself is, you know, especially if you're not someone who's used to reading philosophy, because it is sort of a different way of thinking. Um, I would say, um, like, Stalin's dialectical and historical materialism is good, too. It's like a good intro text written, you know, for similar reasons to, to help um, people uh, understand the philosophy in a simple way. Um, but like Mao's on contradiction is almost like a step up from that. Like you can breathe through Stalin's dialectical and historical materialism and then, then maybe go to on contradiction, then go to Hegel. Um, I wish I had on contradiction with me. I gave it to our comrade Addison. Um, oh. and it's still at his house, but that's all right. He can have it. Um, he's the dude. Um, but that's interesting that you would say it, it, it added theory. I mean, I've, I've heard you say this before, obviously, but that it even added, you know, um, theoretical developments. It, it helped uh, flesh out the um, Marxist uh, theory of dialectics. So, you know, it not only is it simple and easy to understand, um, but it's groundbreaking and, and revolutionary, which is incredible. Um, but it shows like a lot of times bourgeois um, academic work is needlessly complex, you know, and it needlessly uses this vocabulary that you don't really need. And, you know, there are different interest, there are unique vocabulary or Hegelian or Marxist vocabulary words and on contradiction, but they mean very specific things. You know, they mean things that, that have um, material meaning in the real world. Um, so it's very easy to understand. And it shows that, you know, groundbreaking revolutionary work doesn't need to be insanely complex. You know, right. Marx, Marx's capital kind of needed to be because the, the groundwork needed to be laid. Um, but you know, a lot of the stuff that came after that is fairly simple, um, but still incredible. Um, which, yeah, I don't, don't like the, the bourgeois Academy loves to put style over substance. You know, it's all about the substance. Marxism's all about the substance. Marx had a great style when he had the time to actually sit down and write capital volume one is super, super fun to read. Um, cause he put a lot of thought into the structure and the style, but you know, it's the style is intended to help you understand the substance. Um, and there's so much substance packed into those, those volumes, even though they're insanely long, there's no, there's no fluff. Well, I think part of the difficulty um, when it comes to understanding dialectics is not, it, it's, it stems from the fact that it's not just understanding a new idea, but it's understanding a whole new framework for how to think and it's 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 comprehensiveness makes it difficult to truly grasp um but yeah you could 
you could always express it in simpler forms. And to be fair, uh, if there's anything that I, I, I think that I would critique Hegel for would, would be that, but the, look at the context, the, the more difficult writings, the science of logic and the phenomenology of spirit, they're his earlier writings. Um, and he's coming from having uh, a spirit very much based in the alignment, but like the whole purpose of writing, I heard there was there stories where he would give a lecture and if the students understood it, he would go back and make it more difficult. Uh, and then, and so the spirit of it is, you better read this closely if you want to understand it. I don't want people to half-ass read it and then to not really correct. And the, the paradox is that what ends up happening is that because it's so difficult, it gets so many misinterpretations that, you know, it's just a, it's a goldmine for misinterpretations. Um, but the, that's why I recommended, like, start with the lectures on the history of philosophy. People don't read that. And it shows, you know, I was, uh, I told you I've been taking a break uh, the last two, three days from writing. Um, and I was watching uh, a few lectures on Hegel on the internet. And these specialists just start talking, and I'm like, that's not correct. You know, if you would have just read the lectures on the history of philosophy, you would have known why that's theoretically not correct, but why the opinion that you're saying Hegel had of Parmenides or of Heraclitus isn't correct, because he tells you what he thinks about them. And the importance of those lectures on the history of philosophy is that, you know, if, if you don't have a background in the history of philosophy, you learn, but you also learn it through Hegel's understanding of it, and you embed yourself in Hegel's philosophy through it. And... It's also written in a in a lot easier form than his early thing. But back to Mao, it is a, it's an incredibly original text. And he hadn't read Hegel, but if you look at the footnotes, the vast majority of things he's citing from Lenin come from volume 38 of the collected works, which is the what's known as the Philosophical Notebooks. It is a notebook that Lenin uh, made uh, when he was in Switzerland uh, in 1914, basically taking a break and only reading philosophy, um, or mostly philosophy, and most of that philosophy was Hegel. Um, so, like when I read, uh, when I've gone through the science of uh, uh, logic, I go through it having volume 38 next to it, so that I can not only read what Hegel says, but then what Lenin says of Hegel. And that's what uh, that's what um, Mao did. And so he's citing from Lenin reading Hegel, and so he's getting like um, Hegel through secondhand smoke. I guess what's a, what do they call when someone gets like lung second cancer? Hand smoke, yeah. yeah, that's what he's getting his Hegel through secondhand smoke, but he, he definitely got it right because he was able to develop, I think, three important categories. And China's developed even more. Like Chang and Fu has developed the category of a partial qualitative leap, which is just, it's awesome because it helps you think about the stages of capitalism. It's like, well, is it a leap when we transition from competitive capitalism to state monopoly capitalism? And if it's a leap, if we want to say it's a qualitative leap, then we have to say it's a new system. We don't want to do that. It's the same system. It's a different stage in it. So what category do we use? Partial qualitative change. I, love um, that. I mean, the fucking Chinese are amazing. The fact that we are not just always learning Chinese Marxists, I can't attribute it to something other than maybe there's not enough translations, but we can't say that now. So I, it's got to be chauvinism. We just think that, you know, the West is best and all the best philosophy and thinking comes from the West. And the more that I read the Chinese thinkers, the more in awe I am at, at, at how wonderful they are and how amazingly they have been able to develop dialectical materialism. It's it's chauvinism and it's the purity fetish, you know, because we're all, we're all convinced that you know, China's just completely, not we're all, but so many people are convinced that China's just all bad and evil and they've never done anything good to the point where, you know, now this is a more common thing to say, I think, um, at least in the spaces that we're in. Um, but, you know, people will like laugh at you or, or condemn you if you say, if you want to learn about Marxism, read Xi Jinping, read the governance of China. You know, it's him laying out what, what China's doing right now, the largest Marxist country in the world. Um and, and that'll help you understand Marxism in a more practical way rather than reading these postmodernists, you know, rather than reading these sort of um, Frankfurt School pseudo-Marxists. Read from the Marxists and you don't have to read Xi Jinping himself. Like you said, there's tons of amazing Chinese Marxist academics 
um, who are involved in the debate and the construction of socialism um, and, and the development of or further development of Marxism. Um, but, you know, there's people who don't want to read from those who are practically applying Marxism in the real world because they live in this idea, you know, philosophy for them is, is idealistic. It's not about actually changing the world. It's just about, you know, analyzing it and um, talking about it in the ivory tower, I guess. Um, but it's chauvinism and then, the you know, the purity fetish, the rejection. No, nope, I'm not even going to look at what those Soviet scholars said. I'm not even going to look at what those Chinese Marxists have said, the new theories that they've developed, because uh, MSNBC and CNN told me that China's evil. And you know what? I heard David Harvey say it, too, and he's a Marxist. Uh, David Harvey's getting better on that issue. I should have picked someone else. But, you know, I heard this person who calls himself a Marxist say China's evil, too. Um, so I'm just going to completely ignore everything they said. And, and you know, Mao Zedong stuff is, is kind of simple. It doesn't have this, you know, academic flair style. So uh, I'm just going to dismiss it as stupid and, and overly simplistic, which is a lot of um, what a lot of people do call it mechanistic and overly simplistic um, without engaging with it at all, which is something that you, I mean, detailed and, and created a concept that I think perfectly analyzes that that sort of left anti-communism, um, which we call the purity fetish. Absolutely. And it's, uh, you know, it's not just on practice and on contradiction. It's, it's, a, it's scores of really, really good texts. And I include them all here. Like people know on practice and on contradiction and where do the correct ideas come from. But I have basically read almost everything that's in English on Mao and uh, the stuff where he's like explicitly thinking about what dialectics is and giving you examples I have included in, in, in my book. Um, so I, I would recommend checking that out in, in order to have a nice little compendium of all the all of Marx's all of Mao's key writings on dialectical materialism. But um, yeah, and, and what's funny is that you read the writings on Mao that come from the West, and they do that same thing. They make it overly complicated. And I agree with uh, Jose Ortega Gasset. He has this phrase that's uh, that says something along the lines of. Uh, simplicity is the courtesy of the philosopher, but it's simplicity implied as, you know, being able to present complex ideas simply. Um, and that's true, right? If, if you really understand something, you should be able to explain it in a way that everyone else understands it. Um, you shouldn't have to uh, use all this difficult language. And if you, sometimes the difficult language is a result of the fact that you're engaging with something you haven't got into the level of concretization to understand, right? Like you can't pick up volume three of Capital and understand it without reading all of the categories that it presupposes. And that's why it can be considered difficult because it presupposes a bunch of things that you have to know in order to know it. Um, so, you know, there's stuff that's difficult in that sense because in order to understand it, you it's so concrete that you need to know a bunch of other things before. But then there's stuff that that's not the case that they just get things that could be presented in a much simpler manner and overly complicated. And um, I think that's that's uh, that's the business of the academy today. And um, I had a I had a recent interview with Ewoks and he was introducing me, he called me a public philosopher. And I was like, that term shouldn't exist because philosophy is always public. It should be, right? Yeah. The heart of philosophy is in Socrates. What was he doing? He was just walking around talking to people. Talking to people. Slave, <laughs> non slave women, men. Like, you know, Plato's a real feminist. You, you read the symposium, who's the philosopher they point to at the end is Diotima, which is a woman, <laughs> as the, the person who best grasped the idea of the good manifested as beauty and love. So, yeah, he that's philosophy. It's always public. When did it stop being public? Well, when, you know, you have capitalism developed and it commodifies the academy and it creates this nice little sphere where it's profitable to write a bunch of mumbo jumbo um, for, for journals that have $45 paywalls. Um, and it's infuriating and I have to participate in it and I have to, you know, submit my articles like everyone else. And uh, But I, I do, I try to cleanse my soul through the work that I do outside of that. For sure. Uh, we are trying to create an alternative to that, you know, um where our goal has never been to climb, you know, the academic ladder or advance our careers. And, you know, like people have accused us of that. And it's like, 
Carlos and I have both had multiple people contact our universities and try and get us fired, like hordes of people. So, um, you know, that we wouldn't be doing this. Uh, this is not the path we would take if we were just trying to be careerists and advance ourselves academically. Um, but, you know, we're trying to teach this stuff in the spirit of Socrates, I guess, you know, like you said, every, all philosophy should be public. Um, speaking of which I have a, a question um you can let me know if you're tired and you got to dip out here um but i have one more question at least in terms of uh philosophy that i want to ask you that's a little bit different sorry do you need to or... no that was a siren so oh, okay <laughs> um so i was just looking at into schopenhauer a little bit and obviously he lived and taught in the same building as hegel and he hated hegel because they were competitors um but it seems like he kind of takes the easy way the easy route of criticizing Hegel, just dismissing it all as gobbledygook and overcomplicated nonsense that doesn't mean anything, you know, without actually trying to take the time to understand it and engage with it, probably because he hated Hegel. Um, am I right in that and thinking that? That's just my interpretation from taking a quick glance at it from the form of appearance um, after looking at Schopenhauer's work, but not really reading it and diving into it. Right. Well, uh, it's both personal and it's it's, it's a scholarly disagreement, personal because Hegel was on his dissertation committee and when he presented it, he asked a question which he felt was stupid, but which if you look at like the Hegel biographers, it wasn't actually stupid at all. And Schopenhauer thought that by asking- I thought that, that too. And, and if you, sorry, if you watch YouTube videos on it, they say that Hegel is just wrong. You know, Hegel right, right. Has well, guys, category wrong. I'm like, no, that makes sense right. um, in terms of Hegelian philosophy, what he was saying. Right, right. It was a misunderstanding of how Hegel was using. It was a, it was a fair question, and from that question, he felt. And this is what the Weltgeist video leaves out. The Weltgeist is the the YouTube channel. It's a good philosophy YouTube channel. They just did a video on this same topic, and he left out the fact that from that question, Schopenhauer thought that Hegel was trying to fail him. And it's not true. All the evidence shows that Hegel was in favor of passing him, that he yeah. had no problem with him. And Hegel's this massive professor at the time. Like, it got to the point where if you wanted to have, like, the guy give you his opinion about an event here, an event there, you would go to Hegel. That's how big Hegel got. And when Schopenhauer got his post and he scheduled this class at the same time as Hegel, Hegel could have been salty and said, I want this guy out. And guess what they would have done to Schopenhauer? They would have gave him the boot. And other professors wanted that. And Hegel said, no, he's young. He'll learn this and that. So Hegel was super good with Schopenhauer. And Schopenhauer took that personal disagreement and the fact that he probably couldn't understand Hegel uh, <laughs> into this bandata against Hegel that it's all based on, 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 on BS. The video says that Hegel misunderstood certain uh, basic scientific concepts. And it's not a misunderstanding. It's like someone mentioned earlier in the chat, and, and this is not to rail against the person who mentioned it, but they mentioned that the young Hegel was revolutionary, the old Hegel was reactionary. No, it's because there's this phrase that's often used in order to say that Hegel's a, a conservative and that he was just defending the Prussian monarchies, which is that the rational is actual. The actual is rational. What you have to think about is what does this mean in Hegel's concepts? What is the actual? And the actual is the unity of essence and, and existence. And if something measure, if something is able to properly manifest the essence of a thing, then it's actual, right? And he wasn't just saying that what's real has to be supported because it's rational. And another part of that that's left out is if to use a, a Goethe is that all that comes to be deserves to perish wretchedly. So part of the understanding that the rational is actual is the understanding that that changes. <laughs> and that insofar as it's rational in one point, it turns into something irrational and it perishes. So Hegel was an extremely dialectical thinker and, it, and they got these concepts that he was using in a Hegelian manner in a way that you know he developed them and people didn't read it, but they got these concepts and they said, oh, no, he's just a conservative. And they did that from the time that he was around. And he hated it. He hated it because he wasn't a conservative. He would celebrate the French Revolution 
every year he would go out and take his students and buy champagne and celebrate the French Revolution. And you're going to tell me that this guy is a conservative? The problem is that there was a dualism. You're either a liberal or a conservative. And today's historians continue to do that. If you read Losurdo's text, Hegel and the Freedom of Moderns, you'll see that the problem with labeling Hegel a conservative is that it is based on the assumption that because he wasn't a liberal, he's therefore a conservative. And the problem is that he wasn't a conservative and he wasn't a liberal. He was something beyond that. He was something well beyond that. And he was already thinking about the state in a way that was even a little bit, it's still abstract, but closer to a socialist understanding of the state. He was a radical through and through. And I think that a big mistake that we have made is read that rational is actually incorrectly and continue to think that Hegel was a conservative. Had he been in England at his time, he would have definitely been a something close to a socialist. He was already critical of capitalism. If you look at the end of the philosophy of right, he's talking about how basically the system develops into very few having very much and, and many having very little and that the state should step in and do something about that. It's like, well, that's, that's what China's doing. <laughs> you know, that's what a proletarian state does in its first stages of socialism. So read Lesordo on Hegel, Hegel and the Freedom of Moderns. You should be able to find the PDF free online. Dang, that might be my next reading. Thank you for that. I knew that answer would get um, pretty uh, complex and you would get to flex your your knowledge of philosophy there. But I appreciate you that you for breaking that down for us. And that's the that's the beauty of the fact that you've read everything, even these folks like Schopenhauer, you know, so you can debunk all these misconceptions and help us better understand Hegel and, and Marx through understanding their, you know, people who disagreed with them and, and their contemporaries. Um, so appreciate that. Also appreciate um, Chaya. Hope I'm saying that name right. Holy crap. $20. Um, I was going to answer your question for free, um, but thank you so much for supporting the project. And um, uh, yeah, it's a lot of money, but great question that I was actually thinking about today, just uh, coincidentally, when I was reading the Grundrisse, um, I think I actually might have, I don't know, no, it was because somebody tweeted something at me, but uh, it says people talk about how automation is making the ruling class not need the working class anymore. Yet we are seeing the real effects of a labor shortage due to long COVID, quiet quitting, et cetera. How should this be understood? Well, that, that's what the person was trying to say to me earlier, basically, that um, capital can't develop any further. Technology can't develop any further. Capital can't expand anymore. We don't need labor inputs to make that happen. It's, you know, I don't think that is correct at all, especially if you look you know, globally. There are a lot of places that aren't industrialized and aren't developed yet where like capitalism is still developing, still in sort of its early stages. They still have a peasantry, um, you know, like remnants of the feudal structure. Um, so and, and what China has been helping a lot of these countries do is develop, you know, develop their their productive bases um, that that they haven't had. Um, which, you know, in turn, if they have feudal relations of production, will allow capitalist relations of production to come about, um, create the possibility for socialism. But, um, yeah, I mean, labor inputs are still super important to the circulation of capital and like we're, I mean, to the expansion of capital. And like we were saying earlier, um, you have in the U.S. this giant service industry and, you know, a lot of transport workers who you know, keep the circulation of capital going, keep commodities circulating, which if that doesn't happen, you know, the major, um, the major centers of capital, the major corporations, the major firms are going to go under, you know, they have to continually um, sell commodities or, or create um, surplus value. Otherwise, they're going to um, be outcompeted and, and, and go under, which Marx talks about with in times of economic crises, not only do you have a, a halt of the labor, you know, a lot of uh, workers are thrown into unemployment. Um, so you have a halt um, on the amount of, of labor inputs that are going in. But you also have the, the destruction of a lot of capital, meaning you have a lot of these businesses um, that go under and then you just have these factories sitting there, you know, with no workers in them uh, being left to rot. And you have that all over America. Um, and, you know, in a lot of those countries, or I mean, a lot of those uh, cities where the um, the jobs have left and the factories have emptied, the opioids have poured in, um, which is how they've kept circulating capital and Wall Street has kept making money. Um, but in, in automation, you know, is throwing more and more people out of productive labor. Um, automation is, you know, under the contradictory relations of capitalism, 
um, automation does throw the working class out of the workforce and hurt them. And, and under socialism, automation could free us. You know, automation could free us from the amount of intensive labor that we have to do. Um, but I think this idea that there's, you know, there's no need for labor anymore, that there can't be a labor shortage or that the capitalists aren't dependent on our labor, they'll always be dependent on their labor, right? Because they have to continue, continue, continue to make money or they'll go under. And they, you know, there's no way you can do that without labor. Um, so, yeah. You want to take a step back, Carl? Oh, you're frozen. Oh, Am I frozen? Oh. oh, I think you're back now. Hello? Yo, I can hear okay. you, but you're a little... Uh, I'm looking for... Am I still frozen? I can hear you. You're just a tad glitchy. Can, can you hear me? Okay? Should... No, I can. It's a tad glitchy. It should work itself out. No. Oh. You're not frozen for hot Scott. Oh, okay. I I, th I think the, the the freezing is on on your end. Then, oh, um, okay. I'm looking. Okay. I'm looking for a quote. Um, there's a there's a contradiction here, which is that you know, as automation develops. This should be good news for the people who work because it should mean, okay, we get to work less and produce in half the time the same output, right? It's only under capitalist relations of production where automation, instead of being something the working class should be like, oh, awesome, less necessary labor time, more free time to do the shit that I like means instead of that, shit, now I'm going to lose my job or now I have to work for less pay or less hours or whatever the case may be. So it's it's important to to go against the tendency that the, the development of automation is bad because it's not. It's 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 under a socialist society, it would be extremely freeing for human beings not to do certain forms of labor which many people would not find fruitful in themselves. Right. Um, you mentioned productive labor being automated. Now we're gonna start seeing other forms of unproductive labor being automated as well, right? Like transportation, like, like service. Walmart cashiers, you have all self-checkout right. now. I remember in the, um, oh God, I'm almost embarrassed to say, but I had this very bourgeois experience where I had a family member who has a little bit of money. They invited me on a cruise for a 15s. And uh, there was this one bar on the cruise where it was just a fucking robot, right? You just asked for your drink. You're like, okay, give me a daiquiri or a hurricane wow. category five or something. And the robot would make the drink and then serve it to you. Wow. And it's like, you know, in, in the context of socialism, that'd be pretty cool. Um, in the context of capitalism, that means that one or two people who would have been there now are, are no longer there, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to pull up this quote. I think I found it. Um, let me see if I can uh, pull it up and present that it. That robot is fully automated luxury communism, if I've ever heard of it. I don't know if you've ever heard that saying, but that that is what that is. A bunch of robots serving us strawberry daiquiris. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, Big Bill Hayward in his text. Um, let's see. Whatever, I forgot what the text is called. American in, Industrial Unionism, I think it's what it's called. Yeah, Industrial Socialism. Um he says, where wages are low and profits are large, we have a heaven for the capitalists. Uh, no, okay, that's not the one. Um, working people invented practically all the machines. Working people raise all of the cotton and wool. Working people manufacture the cloth. But the idle capitalists own the machines. That is because... Okay, I haven't found... I clearly haven't found the right quote yet. So I, I guess you can continue commenting. I like that quote. For this, but I remember... I guess Big uh, Bill Haywood didn't know that Elon Musk is Tony Stark and he created all the machines, not the hundreds of engineers who work under that under him. They had nothing to do with it. It was him. Okay, so uh, it is the right place. After going through technological developments in industry that have led a tremendous led to a tremendous transformation in 19th century America, Haywood says instead of these developments leading to less work, these foolish workers work harder than they ever did before. If they cannot keep up with the machines, they are discharged and others hired. And I think he goes on in the next thing. Okay, no, he doesn't. But 
um, I might have been foisting better ideas onto uh, Hayward than those which he actually had. But the, the point is that, you know, the, the development of automation should be looked at gladly by, by working people in an ideal society because it should mean you work less. Um, and that's something that should always be brought up. It's not, we should not treat the effects of automation in an ahistorical and universalizing manner. We should help people realize that it is only under our current relations of production where the development of industry and the development of machines ends up translating into you being jobless or you having to work the same amount for less pay or you being in a more competitive position to the other half of the workforce that, workforce that got laid off because now you can produce twice as much. Yeah, and Mark spent so much time analyzing this, you know, how advancements in the means of production throw workers into unemployment. And it's something that we've started calling automation. I don't know if Mark's ever uses that word. For him, it's just capitalism. It's just how it's it just it develops, you know, the means of production constantly. Um, but as it does so, you know, strips workers of their their access to the means of subsistence and um uh yeah the the best theorist who's talked about that is uh the great marxist johnny cash um in his pamphlet john henry um where john henry competes against the machine and then dies in the end <laughs> which one is that one i don't think i've heard it i'm a big cash guy you haven't heard uh john henry's hammer i think that's the name of it no i haven't you haven't that's where our our working class buddy from the tr from the rail union. That's his name, John Henry. That's what it's. No, John about. Henry's a a, a a character of a folk story. That's well, what I thought. He heard it from. Well, then Johnny Cash made a song about it, and that's where I know it from. He's got so many amazing working class songs. He does. That's what country music used to be, man. Before nine eleven, really. Have you noticed that they suppress the working class songs and they promote the other ones? Oh yeah, the the poppy. It's like everything Ramiro says. How he criticizes yeah. music. It's the poppy, like you know, just drink, vote Republican, and and chew tobacco country, rather than the, you know, criticizing automation and the plight of the working class country. Right, right. All the uh, there, it's the same thing I think with Dropkick Murphys. Um, I heard uh, Noah was telling me that they allow you to go into the concert for free if you show a, a, your union card that's awesome i used one of their songs i use shipping up to boston as my walkout song when you're in wrestling so that makes me even happier that's so fucking cliche <laughs> that's what everyone has for baseball <laughs> <laughs> but yeah they're awesome they uh they um they've reinterpreted like pete seeker uh songs and stuff um, i've seen and that, yeah. songs um, even Joe Hill songs like the, uh, the pie in the sky, which I think in the in dropkick Murphy's, it's just called the worker song. It comes from a Joe Hill poem. Hmm. That's very cool. Um, the, the song I was, the Johnny cash song is called the legend of John Henry's hammer. So maybe we'll do that as our intro song, um, for the next stream, even though it's eight minutes long. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> It might help. We usually get uh, more viewers like 40 minutes in. So um, true, we got to see if a 40 minute song. Put like Beethoven's Ninth and start with uh, Beethoven's Ninth <laughs> next time. But, um, now that we do have a lot of viewers, before um, we leave, I just want to tell people if you want to help us, if you want to help Midwestern Marks and the amount of work that we have to do, the amount of labor we have to put into our project. Um, and you want to support us, but you don't have the means to do it financially, which of course, you know, we're never trying to tell you guys to, to donate to us. If you can't afford it, use your money on you. Um, but if you are looking for a way to help, you can go on Twitch and, and highlight our streams. You can go to the part of the streams that you like, and you can mark it as a clip. And you can say, you know, this was something that I really liked. And, and when I go in to make YouTube videos, I see that. I see a little marker where you, you know, said this is what i like this is a the section of the stream i like and that lets me take that little that little piece of the stream and then put it on youtube um otherwise i have to re-watch the whole stream or a huge section of the stream and do it myself which is extremely um time consuming and energy intensive so if you've already listened to the stream um and you want to help us out create some highlights and we'll love you forever 
Yeah, <laughs> we really would because it's uh it's something that we have to do. But every time we do it, it's like I wish I could instead of spending my energy on this, spend it on like writing or or doing a stream or something. So, um, yeah, if if people can help with that, that would be terrific. I'd also like to plug our our little uh, bourgeois merch store. Um, yeah. As some people have uh, called it, now it's supposedly incompatible to have a, a merch. But um, let me see. Let me try to pull it up. Are you pulling it up or? Yeah, I got it here. If you want, I, I can um, do it here. Okay. Yeah. Here, here it's uh, Shopify. Yeah, I throw the link in the chat here. I I I don't know. I mean. We have our Patreon where people just support us by giving us money. We do exclusive videos on the Patreon now, um, so you do get content from the Patreon. But like, I don't, this is just basically, and I know people are of course going to criticize it. Your Mark says, but you're selling stuff. But like, this allows you to support our project. You know, help give us money towards uh, creating more content for Midwestern Marks, um, and you get something in return. You know, you get something material, which also helps, you know, market the project then if you're wearing our, our shirts and stuff, uh, which is the same with our bookstore. You know, it, it not only is the purpose of it education, um, but you can then support our project financially and actually get something in return um, rather than just, you know, giving us money to answer questions or stuff, which we love. But this gives you something material. So. And if you buy gear or like a, a cup or something. And you share it on social media, tag us or, or send it to us. And we will either retweet it or, or share it or something. But uh, yeah, I, this is a, a way to help our, our project um, that uh, where you get something in return. It's not just a, a donation. Um, and also our books. I wanted to mention, I just did a promo video uh, earlier today, but we just got uh, published uh, No Great Wall on the Continuities of the Chinese Revolution. So we talked a little bit about China today, but... This is, uh, I would say, the, the if you haven't read much about China, or even if you have, um, that's that would be a great place to, to go to to learn about the Chinese uh, revolution and how socialist governance adapts to changes uh, both nationally and internationally. Um, it also debunks many myths about like Mao the monster or something like that. That's a whole section where it just gets a bunch of uh, Mao myths about the Cultural Revolution and, and debunks them. So... Um, it also has a wonderful essay at the end that's uh, titled, Will China Have the Same Fate as the USSR? Um, where it does a comparative analysis of the USSR, the Bolshevik Revolution, and the Chinese Revolution, and argues that China's not going to have the, the same fate as the, the USSR. Um, so yeah, ch check that out. I, th I think it's a wonderful place to start in order to uh, learn about the Chinese uh, Revolution and how it's different also in that extra essay in the appendix how it's different from the 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 bolshevik uh, revolution and the experiment of socialism in the ussr you bet recommend everyone check that one out and then also got our other books if the riggins euro communism book that we just published carlos's anthology of classical marxist texts on diamat reading classical texts of marxism and then coming soon we have uh, we have this coming soon, um, too, from another book from Riggins. Um, but we also have the Journal of American Socialist Studies coming real soon that we've been working hard on. And, um, you know, that that's going to be something special, I think. So, yeah, the, the support, y'all. The stuff we have in the forthcoming section is the stuff that's, like, fully ready to go. Um, mm -hmm. But besides that, we have, we have like, 12 books uh, in the works for, for next year, and I'm sure that more are going to, uh, accumulate uh, as we go next year so the publishing press uh, is going to be a very uh, active uh, part of our institute in the coming years so um, I'm, I'm really excited about it and I, I it's been a very long time that uh, you know socialist publications with the exception of maybe like monthly review or something uh, but most socialist scholarship is uh, within uh, major publishing houses that make paperbacks 65 bucks and uh, hardbacks uh, 120 and they make you wait two years until a paperback is and the ebook would be like 50 bucks or something that's not the case here we're giving you the same level of, of scholarship and, and rigor and we're doing it for like 10 15 20 bucks so um, so it's something like that really it hasn't been done in, in a very uh, long time so um, 
we're excited to to see it continue to develop yeah and and thanks all of you like the i should the last thing i should promote here unless carlos says anything else before we go um is the patreon because our book project would be impossible without this like i said we do have exclusive content on here it's me teaching wrestling moves and, and health and fitness videos which is you know a little goofy but i mean these things are the things i'm teaching on here are legit if you do want to learn some self-defense um but really what the the patreon has done is allow us to to start our publishing press and get that off the ground um, as well as you know get our streams off the ground pay for cameras and mics and you know uh computers and stuff but um yeah i mean the the everything that we've done um in terms of the publishing press and you know a lot of the stuff that we've done in general would be impossible without y'all support um so thank you to to all the patreon supporters anybody who gives us super chats anybody who's contributed financially and like our pledge our promise to y'all those who are willing to you know part with the measly wages that you're paid um and, and you know give us a part of that to help our project our promise is that we're always going to take that money and direct it towards expanding the project with the goal of you know helping theory become a material force in the world helping the working class grasp these theoretical revolutionary concepts um you know carlos and i are both pretty freaking poor um we're not just taking this money um for ourselves straight to our bank accounts you know our because we wouldn't want to do that you know it's the money that you give to a marxist institute should go towards you know educating the working class about marxism so thank anybody or thanks to anybody who supported us financially um big or small uh at any point in time absolutely um i have nothing else to plug so, so. all right we talked and, and we said uh before we don't have to make it a three-hour marathon and uh look at us yeah. you know you Here know that means from, uh, what's his name? Paul something. Um, the uh, the actor. It's a it's a hot ones meme. He was interviewed in, in hot ones, and he's like, all right. "Yeah, yeah." He's like, "Look at us!" It's like, "Look at us!" Look at us. Look at us. <laughs> Three hours in. <laughs> That's funny. I love Paul. Right? He's funny. Any books in Spanish in the works? Uh, yeah, not through our our press. We have uh. We have contacted some editors in Latin America to, to, to collaborate in translating uh, some of our books. I, I've been debating as to whether it would be fruitful to have uh, streams in Spanish. There's uh, a bunch of really, really good academics um, in Latin America that I know um, and that I'm getting in contact with, and I would love to interview them. But I think that the main thing that concerns me is, you know, will people watch the streams if they are in Spanish and how long, how much labor would go into having to translate it to have the little uh, words at the bottom. Um, so, the yeah, and I'm, sorry, what were you going to say? The subtitles. The, I said oh, the little words at yeah. the bottom. I forgot what those subtitles <laughs> And And uh, I know it is labor intensive, but I'm in the process of learning Spanish anyways. And my dad's actually a Spanish teacher. I, Forgot. I was going to talk about this actually today, but I'll do it another time when I get to finish the book. But um, this is a beginner Spanish reader for people learning Spanish. And it's about the Cuban revolution um, and about Cuba under Batista and the economic inequality. So obviously my Spanish teacher dad gave it to me because he knows what I'm into and knew it would be perfect for me. It might be perfect for some of you um, as well. But yeah, maybe we will do Spanish streams and maybe I'll be able to join soon. I've been grinding. I got my Duolingo yearly report card this year or today. And, um, spent a lot of hours on that app. <laughs> Does it give you a grade? What uh, what grade did you get? I was top 3% in of all Duolingo users. Hell yeah. That's what that's what Jay would have wanted. Be at the at the top, be at the front at the Vanguard. Um you bet. All righty then. Well, uh, thanks for to everyone who watched and uh, check us out on on social media if you can contribute by helping us through Patreon that'd be uh, great. Check out our books and uh, thanks again for watching everyone. Take care. Solidarity. <laughs>